Hey there, I'd like to take a brief moment of your time. No, unlike Mormons, you don't actually get to have that option here. Do you remember the first Mormon to ever run for president? No. 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 You see, the first Mormon to run for president was actually the first Mormon to ever exist. Joseph Smith. Let's start from the beginning. Why did he run for president to begin with? The biggest reason being, Mormons truly did not have a political party to call their own, because neither Democrats nor Whigs were really appealing to the Mormon vote. You see, Mormons were facing various acts of violence against them, so it was their best interest to have a candidate who cared about Mormons. And none of the candidates really did. Smith knew this because he had wrote letters to John C. Calhoun, Lewis Cass, Richard M. Johnson, Henry Clay, and Martin Van Buren, the five most likely candidates to become president at the time. Only three responded, all three of which having the letter C begin their last name. And they pretty much said, sorry dude, we can't help you. It's kind of funny because even if one of these guys said, yes, we will help with the Mormonism, it doesn't inevitably matter because he didn't even ask the person who would end up winning the election. You know, it, it's a bit ironic. Those letters and the lack of the Mormon vote getting compelled Smith to announce on January 29th that he would run for president as the candidate of the Mormon Reform Party. Now he needed to do two things. One, establish a party platform, and two, pick a running mate. We'll start with the running mate debacle. New York educator James Arlington Bennett was the first choice, but because he was born in Ireland, he couldn't legally take the office of VP, so that threw him out of the trash. A business investor and Tennessee legislator, Solomon Copeland, was offered the position, but declined, so Mormon leader Sidney Ridgen was just chosen to be his running mate because, you know, he's the only one who would say yes. In regards to policy, Smith was kind of all over the place. He called for the protection of Mormons, no duh, but also extended those protections to other minority groups. He also called for the annexation of Texas, California, and Oregon, reducing the size of Congress to two representatives for every million people, re-establishing a national bank, abolishing prisons, and the gradual emancipation of slaves, changing his position from being pro-slavery. But since he was a religious leader, he obviously was a lot more religious than most presidential candidates usually are, because he wanted to transition the United States into a, at best, theodemocratic, and at worst, theocratic kingdom of God. So, I mean, he wasn't the best candidate out there. The biggest question you all may be wondering is this. Was his campaign even close to actually being successful? Well, supposedly, at first, Smith wanted to run simply as a protest candidate for Mormons, but soon started to write things in his journal like, there is an oratory enough in this church to carry me into the presidential chair on the first slide, and when I look into the eastern papers and see how popular I am, I am afraid I shall be president. However, we will never truly know because on June 27th, 1844, he was assassinated. I won't go too in depth into the assassination of him because I'm not a Mormon history channel. I just kind of wanted to give you a brief look at his funny political experiment. An experiment that we're never going to see again because... I mean, how many new religions are getting founded? Are you going to create one and then run for president? I don't think so. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The 13th official Mexican presidential election took place on July 4th, 1976. Echeverria's administration took a different approach than Ordaz, a more populist direction that was more akin to Cardenas. 
First, he nationalized the mining and electric industries, redistributed private lands in the states of Sinaloa and Sonora to peasants, imposed limits on foreign investments, raised government spending for the people, passed the first major environmental regulations, taking a stance against Zionism and pro-Palestinian, and electoral reforms that included lowering the number of members a party needed to become an official registered party from 75,000 to 65,000, increasing the number of congressional seats chosen according to proportional representation from 20 to 25, introduction of a permanent voting card, and raising the age of candidacy from 21 to 30, though not all of his policies were as popular with the left in youth in Mexico. The biggest thing he did was continue slash escalate the Mexican dirty war, which was an unofficial war that the Mexican government did against various leftist groups when they started fighting back against the government as a response to the Tlate Loco massacre. The group leading the opposition was the September 23rd Communist League. The Mexican government, of course, had the aid of the US and the CIA in their operations because killing and suppressing Latin American leftists is kind of their thing. And since the majority of these opposing leftists were younger students, he decided the most brilliant way to stop them ban rock music to quell their political activeness. Unsurprisingly, that didn't work at all. And also the last year of his administration had a huge economic recession. It was pretty noticeable when his popularity faded, as in their equivalent of the midterms, 42 of the seats went to parties other than the PRI. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. The PRI had a very easy time picking its nominee, since they were going through a recession, they chose economic advisor Jose Lopez Portillo to be their nominee. He also, of course, received the nominations of the PARM and the Popular Socialist Party, the latter probably needing to put in a little extra effort to support Portillo's candidacy because, well, you know. Now in regards to opposition, that's where things got a little more interesting. You see, the PAN was going through internal struggles and was unable to field a candidate in this election. So Portillo's biggest opposition was not going to oppose him in this election. He acknowledged this by running under the slogan, All of us are the solution. While there was no officially recognized candidate to run against Portillo, he did have one opponent. Railway union leader Valentin Campa of the Mexican Communist Party the Mexican Communist Party wasn't officially recognized, and Campa had to run as a write-in candidate. Despite this obvious hindering of his campaign, Campa campaigned aggressively for priests' political rights, academic freedom, and democracy within the Mexican army, even reportedly getting 100,000 supporters in 97 town halls, and even having 10,000 come to an event at the nation's capital the day of the election. He campaigned under the slogan, Campa, Candidate of the Workers' Struggle. This didn't deter Portillo, who joked that all it would take was for his mother to vote for him to win the election. And here were the results. Unsurprisingly, Portillo won, unofficially getting 100% of the popular vote. You see, the jury's still out on how the election officially went down. As I stated before, Campo was not counted as a legitimate candidate, so any votes for him were counted as no, so they were basically just thrown out. Campa's vote count is estimated to be either in the many hundreds of thousands to over a million or 6%. Portillo actually acknowledged the flaws in this election and promised that this would be one of the issues that he would tackle during his presidential term. That is, if he made it to his term... You see, there were rumors that Echeverria was going to initiate a coup against Portillo so that he could remain in power. The U.S. ambassador from Mexico even gave a detailed hypothetical where Echeverria would kill Portillo and then use LC-23S and the CIA as scapegoats. While that didn't end up happening, LC-23S did attempt to kidnap Portillo's sister, but it failed and their leader ended up being killed. Inevitably, he did move on to his term. Though, I mean, considering the U.S. and the CIA's whole Mexican leftist thing, this could have just been a regime change or whatever. What will Portillo's changes to the Mexican's electoral system bring to the Mexican political scene? Well, 
Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. In 1969, a group of African American legislators formed a Democratic Select Committee in response to the growing number of representation of African Americans in the U.S. Congress. Those representatives were Shirley Chisholm, Bill Clay, George W. Collins, John Conyers, Ron Dellums, Charles Diggs, Walter Fauntroy, Augustus F. Hawkins, Ralph McCaff, Perrin Mitchell, Robert N. C. Nix Sr., Charles Rangel, and Louis Stokes. Diggs was elected to be the first chair of the caucus upon his founding. In 1971, it was formally rebranded into the Congressional Black Caucus by the order of Charles Rangel. They attempted to meet with the president at the time, Richard Nixon, but Nixon refused and they boycotted the 1971 State of the Union. The whole caucus and all of their members ended up being on Nixon's enemy list soon thereafter. The caucus spends its time advocating for African American interests, as evident by their motto, Black people have no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, just permanent interests. One particular time was when they were the largest voices in America against South African apartheid. The caucus is officially nonpartisan, meaning you can be accepted no matter what your party affiliation is, but I mean, we all know the whole stereotype of African Americans voting typically with Democrats, so unsurprisingly a majority of their members have been affiliated with the Democratic Party. And black Republicans are notorious for not really liking the caucus. Of the eight black Republicans elected to Congress since the caucus's founding, only half ended up joining the caucus. And the ones who did, they were the, well, to use a term, black sheep of the caucus. The first one who joined was Gary Franks, and he was repeatedly excluded from the CBC meetings and nearly quit the caucus because of it. And the most recent one to join, Mia Love, originally entered the caucus to quote, try to take that thing apart from the inside out. But she later ended up growing a kinship to her fellow caucus members. Now, shock of all shock, 100% of the membership of the caucus has been black. Although there was an interesting anecdote that happened more recently. Representative-elect at the time, Steve Cohen, applied to be a member of the Congressional Black Caucus because his district was 60% black. His application was, of course, denied because of, well, I mean, obvious reasons. And Cohen, he pretty much decided, eh, I mean, what you gonna do? But Representative from Colorado, Tom Tecrendo, had the idea. Abolish the caucus. He released a statement decrying the existence of the CBC, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and the Congressional Hispanic Conference, arguing, It is utterly hypocritical for Congress to extol the virtues of a colorblind society while officially sanctioning caucuses that are based solely on race. If we were serious about achieving the goal of a colorblind society, Congress should lead by example and end these divisive race-based caucuses. Caucus member William Clay Jr. was quoted by responding, Quite simply, Representative Cohen will have to accept what the rest of the country will have to accept. There has been an unofficial Congressional White Caucus for over 200 years, and it is now our turn to say who can join the club. He does not and cannot meet the membership criteria unless he can change his skin color. Primarily, we are concerned with the needs and concerns of the black population, and we will not allow white America to infringe on those objectives. Now, despite the haters, the caucus is still going strong, currently having two senators, 51 representatives, and two non-voting delegates affiliated with it. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. On July 18th, 1920, Clinton King Jr. was born to Margaret Allegra Slater and political activist and chauffeur to Booker T. Washington, Clinton King Sr., being the first of seven kids in a middle-class family, all of which would go to lead very successful careers. For a while, his life was just normal, apparently getting married and having kids, but King wanted to do something more and decided to get into education, earning a bachelor's degree at Tuskegee Institute 
and a master's degree from Case Western Reserve University, later becoming an educator from school to school during the 40s until he landed a stable teaching job in 1957 when he started teaching history at Alcorn State University. However, he was a bit of a controversial teacher, known for being a bit eccentric, apparently writing letters decrying the NAACP members as the real Uncle Toms and allegedly attempting to soothe their inferiority complexes through integration and disrupting race relations between whites and ordinary blacks. Yeah, students were able to convince the school to let his contract lapse. One year later, he attempted to have his children be integrated into an all-white school, but his wife and kids fled. I have not found any more info on that part of his life. Then in the summer of that year, he attempted to enter the graduate program of History of the University of Mississippi. However, state troopers arrested him and he was committed to an asylum. His brother, attorney Shaveen Bowers King, with some additional pressure from Martin Luther King Jr., was able to get him out. In 1960, he initiated a run for president under the banner of the Independent Afro-American Party with Reginald Carter as his running mate. They ended up getting 1,485 votes in Alabama, the only state he was able to get on the ballot in. His next run for political office was in 1970, when he attempted a run for the Republican nomination for governor of Georgia. However, he did want the candidate fee to be waived for him and appealed to the Supreme Court to do so. They didn't, and as such, he did not appear on the ballot, but remained in the race as a writing candidate. Fun fact, his brother C.B. King ran for the Democratic nomination against Jimmy Carter. After that, he attempted another presidential run under the ballot line for the Vote for Jesus Party, but similarly, he wanted the ballot access fee waived, and when he tried to get on the ballot in Delaware, he was again denied, so that campaign went nowhere. In 1974, he attempted to run for Georgia State House District against incumbent state rep John White, and got 190 votes. The next big thing he did was not electoral. You see, the night before the 1976 election, King attempted to integrate into Jimmy Carter's all-white church. The reverend was cool with it, but the deacons cited the 1965 rule that banned, quote, all Negroes and civil agitators. When the newspapers reported on this, they seemed to always mention the fact that King had neglected to pay child support since the 1960s. Seems not noteworthy in this particular case, but whatever. 1979 was interesting for him because, one, he established the All Faiths Church of Divine Mission, taking up the title Reverend Rabbi and His Divine Blackness, and initiated his next runs for office when he ran for county commissioner, city commissioner, and the House representatives of the Georgia General Assembly around the same time. But he did get into a heap of trouble when a campaign advertisement in the Albany Journal said he was going, quote, to pay within 30 days after his election $100 in cash to each August 8th voter who punches him for three times, which landed him in jail because that's obviously illegal. After serving his sentence, he appeared on the Republican primary ballot against Representative Webb Franklin. He got 91 votes. He initiated his next run for political office in 1993 when he ran for Metro Dade County Commissioner 3 under the Party of God talent line, getting 48 votes. His campaign was apparently known for overusing profanity. His last run for political office was in 1996 when he ran for Dade County Mayor, again under the Party of God talent line. Supposedly during this campaign, he would appear at events wearing red lipstick and sweatpants. He ended up getting 913 votes. Clinton King ended up dying in 2000 after a bout with prostate cancer. So yeah, of course, he's no Obama or Shirley Chisholm or Cynthia McKinney, but he was the first official African American to legitimately get on the ballot. So yeah, this is a huge bout for African American history. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. We all know about presidential elections, right? I mean, you should. We're in the middle of one. People run, and whoever gets the most votes, in certain areas, wins. But I'm pretty sure we've all had this thought before. Gee, wouldn't it be cool if, insert politician's name here, 
were to run for president? Much like you, I've had that thought before. However, unlike you, I'm making a video on the topic. So in this video, I'm going to go over 12 people I feel should have run for president, either due to just thinking it would have made the election more interesting, or because I think they might have actually had a chance on winning. Now, due to that two varying degrees, this video might be weirdly listed. Like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get a couple of comments saying like, no, this person would have a better chance than this person. But you will inevitably be able to tell which one's more logistics and which one's more personal based because I'll explain it. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's get into the list. Number 12, Big Bill Haywood, 1908. Technically, this and number 9 are suggestions from Sunflower Socialist, and I was originally skeptical of them. But as I did more research, I'm like, oh, okay, I, I guess I see where he's coming from. For those who don't know, Big Bill Haywood was one of the founders of the Industrial Workers of the World, who was tried and acquitted for the murder of populist Idaho Governor Frank Steubenberg. Due to his high profile at the time, Eugene Debs wanted him to run for the Socialist Party nomination instead of just rehashing the 1904 ticket. I put this one on the bottom because, while I do agree with the concept that his high profile may have helped the Socialist Party get to its 1912 totals earlier than it did, it probably would have had the unintended consequence of furthering divide between the Social Democratic and the Radical Socialist wings of the party, a battle that gets fought over and over again in the Socialist Party of America and its successor, the Socialist Party USA. Though he could have curbed it by nominating a sewer socialist like Emile Sedil to be his running mate, inevitably Debs was probably the best choice for the party to have as their nominee at the time, because he was truly the only person who could appeal to both of the wings of the party. Number 11, Elizabeth Warren, 2016. Now, of course, Elizabeth Warren's 2020 presidential run has been met with, you know, views coming from both establishment and progressive factions within the Democratic Party. Prior to 2015, Warren was seen as the only person who could actually give Hillary Clinton a good progressive challenge. She was higher profile than Bernie at the time, creating the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and flipping a high profile Senate seat. Many progressive groups really wanted Warren to take the high profile to the presidential race, except ironically the progressive group that is most associated with her. Bernie himself even tried to get Elizabeth Warren to run, but for many reasons she didn't take up the mantle and her actions during and after the 2016 primary have tarnished her reputation within the progressive community. If she had taken the calls to run back then, we'd be in a slightly different position than we are now. I mean, I doubt the term democratic socialism would be as popular as it is now, and all of this progressive momentum behind Bernie, you know, with the rise of Justice Democrats and brand new Congress and the like, would all be focusing on Warren. Now, could she have won if she ran? Mm, I mean, considering what happened to Bernie during his run, I doubt it. Number 10, a big name progressive, 2012. I put this one low due to the fact that there is no singular candidate we can place in this slot, as there are a few asterisks and the like for it. But if there was a decent challenger to Obama's left, Republicans wouldn't be the only ones that were having an interesting time at the moment. I mean, look at all the big names that were thrown out as potential progressive challengers. Bernie Sanders, Russ Feingold, Dennis Kucinich, and a couple more. Ralph Nader even had a plan where multiple progressive candidates would challenge Obama in the primary, each focusing on one particular issue. Feingold would focus on civil liberties, Dennis Kucinich would focus on foreign intervention, Bernie would focus on economics, etc. Nader's plan didn't include himself as a candidate, but maybe if he took the first step and ran himself, maybe we would have seen more people rise to the challenge. I feel that if a strong leftist ran, they could have given Obama a run for his money, at least in getting some concessions on policy. Not to take away from the lefties that did run, but if I had to choose a scenario where Sanders, Feingold, and Nader challenged Obama, or the one where Wolf, Richardson, and Haywood did, I think we all agree on which one we would have rather seen. Number 9, Lincoln Chafee. 
Okay, so this one might require some context for those who aren't in the know. Apparently, Republican Senator at the time, Lincoln Chafee, wanted to initiate a McCarthy-like primary challenge to George W. Bush, mostly due to his position on the Iraq War. Well, he inevitably didn't pursue that endeavor. Maybe he should have. It would have been interesting for Chafee to tap into a market that never seems to get tapped into when the GOP is in power. Anti-war Republicans. We get like one or two when the GOP tries to take down a Democratic president, but when it's a GOP president, the anti-war Republicans seem to just tuck their tail between their legs and walk off. Chafee could have been that voice, as an incumbent member of the U.S. Senate would get a lot more press coverage than former governor of a state nobody cares about. In case you didn't notice, I'm actually comparing Lincoln Chafee to himself because his 2016 one was a complete disaster. Although, to be fair, Chafee probably wouldn't have been the best choice for that anyways, and someone like a Ron Paul figure probably would have done better. Chafee was the one who was closest to doing it, so Chafee gets the credit and the spot on this list. But if you're one of those hardcore Lincoln Chafee supporters that are like, Aw, oh, dang it, I could have voted for him in 2004 and in 2016? When can I vote for him again? Well, register as a libertarian and you'll find out. Number 8, Sarah Palin, 2012. Okay, so I know Palin isn't exactly the sharpest tool in the shed, and you may not have the most positive views about her, Let's just look at this objectively. After her breakout role as the VP candidate in 2008, Palin became a major figure in the new conservative movement with the Tea Party. When 2012 rolled around, she was one of the highest polling Republican candidates. Many polls showed her either coming a close second to, tying with, or surpassing eventual nominee Mitt Romney. Even while the news media was making fun of her for her you know, eccentricities, they were acknowledging the fact that she was probably what could be considered the Republican frontrunner at the time. Some of the polls even took it a step further and said that Sarah Palin could have done decently well if she and the Tea Party decided to go the third party route and not even go with the Republican Party. While I disagree with her immensely, don't deny it, her running would be interesting to say the least. We could have seen a battle between the wings of the Tea Party be hashed out in the primary with Paul and Palin going at it over their disagreements, and even the title of the Tea Party's presidential candidate might have been given to someone at the movement's height rather than the year the movement died. And we'd have Palin gaffs galore. Though to be fair, the term Sarah Palin is the winner probably would have ended in the primary because polling showed that she wouldn't have done any better than Romney. Though considering Romney is in the Senate right now, maybe we'd be saying Senator Sarah Palin rather than having her be an uh, artifact of an era long forgotten. Number 7, Mike Bloomberg, 2008. This may be surprising nowadays since we all see Mike Bloomberg as an out-of-touch billionaire buying himself relevancy in the 2020 election, or, dare I say, an oligarch. But when you actually do some digging, you'll realize Bloomberg was really popular among third-party activists from his exit in the GOP in 2007 to 2012, probably because he gave some serious Ross Perot vibes, rich, centrist, independent, but also had the advantage of being an elected official, so his third party slash independent presidential ambitions could have more success than Perot at the height of the Reform Party. People were like literally founding group after group after group trying to draft Bloomberg to run for president as an independent or as a new third party bid, ranging from the independent Greens of Virginia to Unity 08. But for some reason, Bloomberg did not heed the call when people were legitimately interested in him running for president and decided, no, it has to be 12 years since the last group of people wanted me to be president. It has to have been seven years since I've been serving in an elected office. And it has to be done not due to people liking me, but because I'm able to raise $257 million in advertisements to buy myself political relevancy again. 
Those are the only conditions I can have to run for president. And I'm not even going to use it to build an independent political movement at all. It's going to be in one of the two major parties. As you can see, I'm not one of the influencers that he's trying to buy. Number six, Jesse Ventura, 2000 or 2016. Now, Ventura running for president is kind of a joke amongst the independent third party or just any political group, period. But this wrestler turned mayor turned governor turned news media guy is well known for his huge hatred for the two party system and has made his way into notoriety in various third party circles from the reform party to the libertarians to even the green party. <laughs> With the reform party going off of its 1996 results they needed a candidate that could take the party into success and they saw Jesse Ventura the only person who's been elected to office as a member of the Reform Party, to be the only person who could do so. Now Ventura saw differently, he thought a certain other political figure would be able to do that. But in all honesty, I do think that the Reform Party had it right when they wanted to get Ventura to run. I mean, Ventura was able to beat a Humphrey in Minnesota. That's like beating a Kennedy in Massachusetts, beating a Bush in Texas, beating a Long in Louisiana. You just don't do that. That's just not possible. Especially when you're running a third party bid. Plus, with Ventura being the pretty much go-to guy to be the Reform Party nominee, the buchanan Hagland war might have either been downplayed or just flat out non-existent because... They probably would have just been like, yeah, we're, we're not winning, so we, 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 we can't even bother. I also speculate a 2016 run probably could have been interesting as well. Because if Ventura was able to be the third candidate in the race, he probably would have been able to form a decent coalition with the Libertarians and the Greens and could have pulled well for him to at least get enough support to get in the debates, which could have led to a Ventura presidency. Because Ventura just says, if a third party candidate can get on the stage, they'll easily win. Too bad Ventura's never gonna pull a Ventura again in the future. Number 5. Paul Wellstone, 2000. Boy, another Minnesotan populist. I mean, who else is gonna be on this list? Eugene McCarthy, Keith Ellison, Al Frank, oh right. Anyways... This is a so-so thing because technically Wellstone was on his way to announce a presidential run, but his multiple sclerosis prevented him from doing so. But Wellstone actually had really huge presidential ambitions. He wanted to campaign all across the country in a Robert Kennedy-like way, even retracing Kennedy's 1968 presidential route, although I assume he probably wanted to skip the ending. <laughs> saying how he was part of the democratic wing of the democratic party a quote that we attribute to another populist like campaign in the future with howard dean and with other populist campaigns before and after dean such as jesse jackson dennis kucinich bernie sanders and the like it shows that there was and still is a huge movement that could have been well behind paul wellstone he would have at the very least done a better job than Bill Bradley in bringing that left-wing, progressive, populist-type challenge to Al Gore. Though with Wellstone's campaign style and charm, you can at least look and say that there's at least a reasonable chance that Wellstone could have been driving that green bus all the way to the White House. Number 4, Joe Biden, 2016. Now, I know what you're thinking. I watch your podcast and follow you on Twitter. You always talk crap about Joe Biden being a presidential failure and how he should drop out because he stinks and nah, 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 nah. I have explained and stated multiple times if he wanted to run, he should have done it in 2016. He would have come off the still popular Obama administration and would not have had his honeymoon period be over with progressives. At the time of the 2016 election, Biden was loved by the younger generation of working class voters, i.e. the base that was not too keen on Hillary Clinton. 
There would, of course, be, like, a couple of reservations, obviously. His record didn't just magically appear within the 2016 election and the 2020 election. But, like I said, he would have still had his honeymoon period. Young voters who weren't as critical of Obama as they are now would have been able to just be like, yeah, Joe Biden will just continue Obama years. I like Obama years. The reservations would be there, but people would have been like, He's my fun Uncle Joseph, not handsy Uncle Joseph. And there was actually still legitimate momentum behind Joe Biden at the time. Many people on the ground and in the mainstream media were really adamant on the idea of Joe Biden running. Now that four years have passed since he has served in a position of power, we're not exactly that keen on Biden being president. And in regards to him winning... It probably would have been, at the very least, closer than the Hillary Clinton one. Though I do believe maybe he could have edged out. He probably would have at least retained two of those swing states, if not all three. Just because a working class voter might not have been that keen on Joe Biden's errors in trade and such. But since many people keep saying don't try to rehash 2016, uh, let's not rehash it and acknowledge that his chance has passed. As the second presidential candidate to drop out in 2020 said, Pass the torch. Number 3, Huey Long, 1936. Huey was similar to Wellstone in that he was just on his way to announce a presidential run, but couldn't because, well, you know. But Huey's presidential ambitions were not only planned for a long time, but also struck fear in FDR because Huey was probably the only guy who could legitimately beat him. Because unlike all these other plebs, Huey was running against the New Deal from the left. Now again, you might say, well, I mean, why was he so scared? Wasn't Roosevelt a really popular president at the time? Yes, he was a popular president, but by 1935... Huey had 27,000 clubs known as the Share Our Wealth Societies, various groups that would support Huey Long's Share Our Wealth program, with a combined total of 7.5 million members across the United States. If you don't think that would translate to votes for Huey Long, I don't know what does. FDR hated him, the two major parties hated him, pretty much everybody at the top of the socioeconomic ladder hated him but the people loved him they couldn't get enough of his platform and wanted to see him enact this platform the real question wasn't was he gonna run for president but the question is how was he gonna do it because there's never really been a consensus on how Huey was gonna do it because he didn't get to that part there were three theories on what he was gonna do he was gonna either a run purely as a Democrat in the primary and then beat FDR there, B, run solely under the share our wealth ticket, or C, initiate someone else to run a third party bid to split the left wing vote, then under the disaster of the Republican administration that would follow, Huey could easily just waltz in and take over the United States, either through a fascistic takeover or just winning an election and then becoming a fascist. You see, many people were caught up on the fact that Huey was a demagogue and was easily turnable to be a fascist. Yeah. His friends were the fascistic ones, not him. The previous two strategies probably would have been the most beneficial for Huey to become the president fish rather than the kingfish. But of course, considering what happened, we'll never truly understand if any of those strategies would have worked or if having him as a president at all would have been a good thing. Number 2, Martin Luther King Jr., 1968. Yes, this isn't some kind of other Martin Luther King Jr. This is THE civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr. You see, before McCarthy entered the 1968 race, people were still actively looking for a big-name anti-war activist to run against Lyndon B. Johnson. And the minds of future Congressman Allard K. Lowenstein clergyman William Sloan Cuffin, and six-time presidential candidate Norman Thomas, as well as many average Joe activists, 
either inspired by those three or inspiring those three, cooked up the idea of having King run for president as a third party anti-war, anti-poverty candidate as it was the height of the poor people's campaign. The activists even took it a step further and had already had a running mate in for him in mind with Dr. Benjamin Spock as the ideal choice. And King was actually considering it for a bit, but he ultimately decided against it because he felt that his role as an activist working outside of a traditional politics suited him better than doing things electorally. I mean, he didn't get the 1964 Civil Rights Act passed because he got elected. Although, considering who else would run in the general election, would you not like to have seen a 1948-like campaign with King, Wallace, Nixon, and Humphrey? It would have been a very interesting campaign, to say the least. I mean, could you imagine if they actually, like, got these four guys to do a debate on TV? And I mean, the timing was kind of perfect because... Around the same time, civil rights activists and peace activists were forming the Peace and Freedom Party, so I, he had the perfect vehicle to run a presidential campaign. And I mean, of course, since we know what would happen to Martin Luther King Jr. by the end of 1968, it would have meant that two presidential candidates would have been assassinated during the time period, so that's obviously a downside. Number one, Alexander Hamilton. First three elections... Alexander Hamilton, founding father, founder of the Federalist Party, first secretary of treasury, guy on the $10 bill, and of course, Broadway musical star. With all that under his belt, let me just ask, why the heck did he never run for president? Like, no, seriously, the guy who founded the other major US political faction at the time ran for president, but why the heck did Hamilton not do so? Hamilton is considered to be vicariously puppeteering presidency through George Washington. Why didn't he just cut out the middleman and do it himself? Now, there's actually two prevailing theories on this. The first one that I heard is he was born in Charlestown, Nevis, British Leeward Islands, so he was not born in the U.S. and he couldn't because he's not a natural born citizen. That's stupid because the Constitution clearly makes the case for Hamilton to be president by saying no person except a natural born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this Constitution shall be eligible to the office of president. I'd assume that being one of the founding fathers would mean that Hamilton declared himself an American citizen when the Constitution was being drafted. In fact, I'm pretty sure he was doing that while he was serving in the American army during the Revolutionary War. Though, I mean, I guess this does make it easy for all of you non-citizens in the United States who have the ability to time travel. Just travel back in time to when the Constitution was being drafted, declare yourself a citizen then, then you'll be able to run for president. The second and more logical one was that the timing just never seemed right. You see, Washington had the first two elections easily in the bag, so he didn't run in either of those elections, but that just means, oh, I'll just run in 1800, right? Well, the Reynolds affair happened around that same time, so it pretty much made Hamilton unelectable for the general populace. Now again, that makes sense, but again, it just doesn't explain why he didn't just try one of the first two times. He could have easily just told Washington, hey, don't run in this one, let me run to get the country in order, and you can be cool in the second time. I'll only run for one term just so you can try for the second term. I mean, people considered Adams to be the only person who could have actually potentially beaten Washington, so why didn't Hamilton try to be that guy? I guess we'll never truly know. It just seemed like he was the one person that could have run for president and probably could have been the first one. At least then he'd be deserving of that $10 bill spot. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow my Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report.
Now we all know the 2012 GOP primaries look similar to the 2020 Democratic primaries. As such, it may be difficult to tell who is technically considered an other in this field. Well, I mean, difficult for you all. If you really want to be accurate in this field, all but these eight would be considered the others. And yes, even though Ron Paul was treated like an other, he still gets to be part of the big guys because, I mean, come on. First, we're gonna have to be fair and acknowledge there was a lot of speculation on people who may run as a Republican in the 2012 election, ranging from Sarah Palin, Dick Cheney, John McCain, Jeb Bush, Donald Trump, even Clarence Thomas was speculated to throw his hat in the ring. But remember, those are only some of the names speculated to throw their hat in the ring. Now, in regards to actual candidacies, these are people that kind of ran, but not entirely. First, there was Alabama Supreme Court Justice Roy Moore, who had made an exploratory committee to run for president. He's known for traditionally being further to the right on the conservative field. When he realized that the Republican Party wasn't that right wing, at least not entirely yet, he was speculated to run for the candidacy of the Constitution Party, but eventually decided to head back to Alabama. The next candidate is represented from Michigan at the time, Thaddeus McCotter. Now to draw another parallel to 2020, if I were to compare his candidacy to someone else's, it would be Seth Moulton. In particular because he never really made it on any of the debate stages and didn't really make any splashes in the presidential run. He came in and then he came out. After that doozy, he decided to run for his old seat, but then he dropped out of that race too because his petition was on the, to be on the ballot was denied due to forgery and then he later had to end up resigning from his congressional seat following that scandal. Another candidacy that kind of just went in and then just kind of dissipated fast was the candidacy of Andy Martin, a perennial candidate, and the guy who actually started the Obama is a secret Muslim conspiracy theory. He only appeared on the ballot in New Hampshire and only got 19 votes. But I mean, come on, this guy started a huge political rumor for when I was a kid. Of course he had to get mentioned somewhere. Another minor candidacy was Pennsylvania State Senator Stuart Greenleaf, who filed a run for the New Hampshire primary and nowhere else. He only got 24 votes. Next, there were three major perennial candidates that also filed a run for the presidency. Jack Feller, Jonathan Sharkey, and Jimmy McMillan. But these three dropped out to run as the Prohibition Party nominee, start a film career, and run for New York City mayor, respectively. The next category for candidates are ones that appeared on a couple of state ballots. And by that I mean literally a couple. Like, they usually only appear on two. First was Keith Drummond, a businessman from Texas, who was on the ballot in New Hampshire and Missouri. He only got 195 votes. Next was Randy Crow, a business owner and conspiracy theorist from North Carolina, who originally filed as an independent. He was on the ballot in New Hampshire and Louisiana. He ended up receiving 198 votes. Next was Christopher Hill, an airline pilot from Kentucky. He was on the ballot in New Hampshire and Arizona, and he got... 247 votes. Then there was Mark Callahan, a perennial Oregonian candidate who was on the ballot in New Hampshire and Arizona. He got 378 votes. Another was Michael J. Meehan, a realtor from Missouri. He was on the ballot in New Hampshire and his home state. He got 410 votes. And lastly was L. John Davis Jr., a businessman from Colorado. He was on the ballot in New Hampshire and Texas and received 3,901 votes. Now, much like the first of my other 2016 Democrats video, these four guys are the ones that kind of teeter on being considered major and minor candidates, especially the first one. The one that had the most credence of being considered a major candidate was former governor of Minnesota, Tim Pawlenty. Pawlenty was running on the traditional social conservative platform. The most maverick position that he took was that he actually advocated for unions, well I mean in the private sector. Public sector unions are still a no-no. He actually managed to appear in some of the debates. Well I mean only three of them, but that's more than everyone else in this video. However, his Midwesterner Minnesotan candidacy was eclipsed by someone who was running a similar campaign style to his, Michelle Bachman. 
and as such, he kind of tried to get a rivalry between the two of them on. After he got a distant third in the aim straw poll, he ended up jumping out of the race. However, he did manage to get six right in votes. Another candidate that had some credence of being a major candidate was former governor of New Mexico, Gary Johnson. Gary Johnson was notable for announcing his campaign the earliest of all of these guys, well, I mean, the earliest of the major candidates at least. And before he even announced his candidacy, he went to Ron Paul to tell him that he was going to be running for president. You know, because these two would be aiming for the same crowd, the libertarian wing of the GOP, so Gary Johnson obviously wanted to keep that momentum purely on him and not Ron Paul. However, when Ron Paul eventually did announce, Johnson got paul -entied. Johnson appeared in the first debate, but was quickly pushed off of that stage fast. I mean, look at all the ends on this page. All but one of them are for Gary. While the GOP gave the obvious polling threshold as a validation for the exclusion, Gary decried his exclusion because the polling threshold literally seems to only be targeting his campaign and not anybody else's. Hmm, I wonder where I've heard this before. However, when Gary did manage to get back on the debate stages, he made a decent impression. Like, I mean, he was considered the winner when he got back. Most candidacies don't disappear for that long and then make a big splash when they return. It's usually they leave and then they're never seen again. Despite this success, the GOP pretty much did the same thing they did to him earlier a second time, which compelled Gary to eventually just drop out of the Republican primary as he was literally going nowhere. He was still on enough ballots to get 4,364 votes. He later decided to seek the nomination of the Libertarian Party and... Well, we all know what happened after that. The next candidate was former representative and governor of Louisiana, Buddy Romer. Romer was notable for his maverick political position throughout his tenure in office. When he was a Democrat, he would break with them and often side with the Republicans, and vice versa. He took the mantle that was supposedly Romney's moderate Rockefeller Republicans that, like Gary's libertarianism, did not make the GOP establishment treat Buddy like a buddy, with Romer not being invited to any of the official GOP debates, citing again polling criteria. So acknowledging that the GOP would not give him a fair shot at the nomination, he started seeking alternative routes for his political career, officially dropping out of the GOP primary in February 2012. But his primary campaign did manage to get on the ballot in eight states and Puerto Rico, and got 33,212 votes. Afterwards, Romer sought the nominations of America's elect, the Reform Party, and the Modern Whig Party. But after the biggest of these groups announced that they wouldn't run a candidate, Romer decided to drop all of his presidential ambitions. Now the last other candidate was political consultant and activist Fred Carger. Carger was like Johnson and Romer, and by that I mean the GOP establishment hated him, and unlike the other two, it may have been more than just his political positions. You see, Carger was gay, and in fact, openly so, being the first openly gay Republican candidate for president, and that obviously played a part in the undermining of his campaign. Though to be fair, his positions were definitely not helping him either. He supported legalizing same-sex marriage, uh, shocker, having a protectionist trade policy, gun control, and lowering the voter age to 16. So yeah, move over Luka Doncic, this is the real maverick. Now despite the fact that Carger of course didn't manage to get on the big boy debate stage, Carger, Johnson, and Romer did debate each other online, so at least the screwed over candidacy stuck around with each other. Unlike those guys, Carger actually did not drop out until really late in the game. Running the third longest candidacy of the primary, in fact, he ended up dropping out after the Utah primary, which was the final state to hold a primary. I think the reason why was because he was a huge critic of the Mormon church and was a huge critic of Mitt Romney due to the fact that the Mormon church was, you know, not so good with the gays, believe it or not. By the end of it all, Carter managed to receive 10,831 votes overall. Now, of course, in this election cycle, 
We've been seeing people decry one major party's presidential primary or the other party's major presidential primary for being unfair, tipping the scales, blah blah blah. This minor video series of minor candidates is to show you this isn't something that the other guy is. Both major parties are guilty of this. And you should acknowledge that rather than pointing the finger at each other and being like, No, they're the bad ones. They're the guilty ones of doing this. You should acknowledge both major parties are guilty. Minor parties, not so guilty of this. And even then, it's usually because they don't have the membership to have a full-fledged primary. And maybe you all can change that on every party. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when the future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. El Pleo de Unam presentas Elecciones Presidenciales en la Historia Mexicana The 14th official Mexican presidential election took place on July 4th, 1982. When Portillo was elected, Mexico was in the midst of an economic crisis. He attempted to fix this by using Pemex to discover more petroleum reserves and joined with a pact with Venezuela to sell oil at preferential rates to Central American countries. It helped Mexico for a bit, but led to a severe debt crisis. In regards to foreign policy, they gave support to the Sandinistas in Nicaragua against the Contras. But the biggest thing that he did during his term was reform Mexico's political system. He made it so that the Chamber of Duties was now 400 seats, 300 of which would be elected via the tried and true first past the post system, where whoever gets the plurality in each district wins. The remaining 100, however, would be rewarded via proportional representation, meaning if a party gets 1% of the vote, they win 1% of the seats up for contest. That greatly helped minor parties be able to grow and prosper, as evident by the 1979 midterms. First, the Mexican Communist Party got a resurgence getting 18 seats after years of silence. The next party was the Socialist Workers' Party of Mexico, a Marxist-Leninist party that got 10 seats in the Chamber of Duties. The last new party to rise was the Mexican Democratic Party, a far-right political party birthed out of the National Syndicalist Union of yesteryear, which also got 10 seats in the Chamber of Duties. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. First, let's start with the opposition parties running candidates, starting with the triad of leftist parties. First, the Mexican Communist Party, after all these years of dormancy and political suppression, what's the first thing that they do after they win an election? Disband and form a new political party. That party being the Unified Socialist Party of Mexico, which was a coalition of the Communist Party as well as other minor socialist political parties. They nominated former Chamber of Duties member and former Communist Party Secretary General Arnaldo Martinez Verdugo. Second was the Socialist Workers' Party, who nominated Candido Diaz Querecendo to be their candidate. There is no more info I can find about their candidate. But the third came from a political party that formed right after the midterms, the Workers' Revolutionary Party, a Trotskyist political party birthed from the student protests, which had spent years building up a base and a platform to challenge the PRI in this election. This party was notable for two things. One, being the first Mexican political party to campaign on gay rights, nominating many LGBT people in down-the-ballot races, and two, nominating the first woman presidential candidate in Mexican history, nominating activist Rosario Ibarra as their candidate. Now that we've seen what's going on on Mexico's left wing, why don't we head to the right wing and see what's going on there? First, the Mexican Democratic Party nominated party founder Ignacio Gonzalez Goyaz to be their candidate, and while Goyaz was relatively popular, the right wing of Mexico was mostly dominated by the National Action Party, who nominated PAN activist Pablo Emilio Madero, who ran under the slogan, Viva Madero Que Viva. Now that we've seen what the wings have to offer, what does the body of the bird have to offer? President Portillo was again tasked to pick a candidate to be his successor, rather than moving on to do what literally every other political party is doing at the time and doing a convention, 
he ended up doing another process of elimination to narrow down his contenders. The final three contenders for the nomination were Secretary of Finance, David Ibarra Munoz, Secretary of Labor, Javier Garcia Paniagua, and Secretary of Budget and Planning, Miguel de la Madrid. Madrid ended up being chosen against the wishes of his party, which indicated divide between the traditional politics of yesteryear and the new emerging technocrats. Though he did try to emphasize his traditional liberal values, as evident by his slogan, for the moral renewal of society. He, of course, also ended up receiving the nominations of the Popular Socialist Party and the PARM. Now, as you can notice, the PRI has quite a few people trying to challenge them, and while it is true each of these guys were relatively popular in their own rights, the opposition is sort of divided up into their own little cliques. Even parties that would normally agree on 95% of the issues, they're divided into their own little cliques. So while Madrid and the PRI had hefty opposition, it wasn't necessarily concentrated enough to give the PRI any real challenge, at least electorally. And here are the results. Madrid won, getting 74.3% of the popular vote. Madero came in second with 16.4% of the popular vote. Verdugo came in third with 3.7% of the popular vote. Goyes and Ibarra got 1.9% of the vote respectively. And Querecedo got 1.5% of the vote. And in the Chamber of Duties, the PRI got 299 seats. The PAN got 51 seats. The Unified Socialist Party got 17 seats. The Mexican Democratic Party got 12 seats. The Socialist Workers Party got 11 seats. And the Popular Socialist Party got 10 seats. Now, as you can see, there's still growing discontent with the PRI, so the PRI is glad that the opposition will never unite at any point in the future. Right? Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when the future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. After the abolition of slavery, social moralists had decided to move on to two more major issues, Mormon polygamy and the prohibition of alcohol. Polygamy was easily able to get rid of due to the overtly Protestant nature of the US at the time. Alcohol was a bit harder. However, with family violence brought on by alcohol, the saloon-based political corruption and alcoholism faced in the US, it was a movement that was starting to pick up momentum. The next logical step was to translate it into political action, and as such, in 1869, the Prohibition Party was born. The party's number one issue was, of course, Prohibition. However, while Prohibition was not exclusively right or left, there were many people from both sides of the aisle that argued for Prohibition. The party approached Prohibition from a conservative viewpoint. The party did, however, adopt one major progressive platform plank, giving women the right to vote, giving women full delegate rights at an 1872 presidential convention, where they nominated prohibition activist and founding member James Black to be their nominee, and the first party chairman, John Russell, to be their running mate. They managed to get 5,607 votes. The reason for their lower voter turnout, despite the fact that prohibition was slowly rising in popularity, was the fact that many prohibition advocacy groups like the Anti-Saloon League, did not support third parties. Four years later at their second convention, they nominated former representative and governor Green Clay Smith to be their nominee, and lawyer Gideon T. Stewart as the running mate. They ended up getting 6,945 votes. By 1880, the Prohibition Party had made a steady rise as Prohibition became a more pressing issue in the era, and they were getting more high-profile support for the party. 1880 was the first to make it known by having the party nominate former mayor of Portland, Maine, Neil Dowell, to be their candidate, and Professor Henry Adams Thompson to be his running mate, both of whom were known for being former Republicans who left the GOP because they would not go far enough in regards to prohibition. The thing is, unlike the previous tickets, Dowell didn't really focus on the presidential election, 
instead choosing to focus on campaigning for down-the-ballot prohibition candidates in Maine. Despite this lack of campaigning, the GOP begged Dow to drop out of the race in fear that he may spoil the election against them. Dow refused and ultimately got 0.11% of the popular votes. And no, his presence didn't spoil the election at all. By 1884, the climb had gotten more noticeable when they nominated former governor of Kansas, John St. John, for president, and former Maryland state legislator, William Daniel, as his running mate. This campaign, unlike the previous ones, actually had the added bonus of being supported by larger prohibition groups and figures like the Women's Christian Temperance Union and Francis Willard, which made the party's support grow to 1.5% of the popular vote. He was accused of being a spoiler due to the fact that his vote total in New York was larger than the vote margin between the two major candidates, and New York could have swayed the election. Though New York wasn't a consistent swing state at the time, so there really wasn't any worry. Later in 1888, they nominated senior officer during Reconstruction, Clinton B. Fisk for president, and religious scholar John A. Brooks to be his running mate. Like the previous two elections, the spoiler accusations was thrown out at him. Despite this, he managed to get 2.2% of the popular votes. During the 1892 election, there was a bit of an interesting development. You see, the People's Party was in full force, and they aimed for a similar but different group of rural voters than the Prohibition Party. Due to that, there were actually talks with the two parties merging together into one, and they were actually relatively close to doing so, but some more radical members of the Prohibition Party were not keen on watering down the Prohibition message by adopting populist rhetoric. Plus, the Prohibition Party convention was held in Cincinnati, so when the Southern populace sent their mostly black delegates, they were turned away. So yeah, that plan flopped, but nevertheless, they kept trucking along. There were three candidates who sought the nomination of the Prohibition Party. Party Chairman Gideon T. Stewart, Magazine editor and former NYC mayoral candidate William Jennings Demerst, and former California representative John Bidwell. It was expected that the race would be a close one between Bidwell and Demerst, but it was actually the New York delegation that gave Bidwell the nomination. The VP nomination was also highly contested between religious pastor James B. Cranfield and Baptist figure Joshua Levering. Cranfield ended up becoming the running mate. Bidwell's last run for public office was while affiliated with the anti monopoly party, so there was obviously still a bit of attempt to appeal to populists. The ticket ended up getting 2.24% of the popular vote. Spoiler alert, this was the highest amount of votes and percentage that the party got. With that vote total under the belt, the Prohibition Party was reinvigorated to push themselves further than they have ever gotten before. However, there was an issue on how to do so. Some members, led by John St. John and Reverend Charles Bentley, dubbed the Broad Gagers, wanted to expand the Prohibition Party platform to include free silver and women's suffrage. Wait, I thought they were already in favor of women's suffrage. I guess at one point the Prohibition issue kind of took precedent over everything else. Another faction, led by Joshua Leverig and Professor Samuel Dinkle, called the Narrow Gagers, wanted to keep the platform to just no alcohol allowed. Both factions ran a candidate to represent them in the Prohibition Party primary, Bentley and Leverick respectively. The infighting had gotten so bad that even when the narrow gaugers were actually considering giving some concessions to the broad gaugers, the broad gaugers were already considering yeeting off to form a new political party. Since the narrow gaugers were the ones who were in charge of the party, Levering ended up being the nominee, with attorney Hale Johnson being selected as his running mate. The broad gaugers then walked out and started another political party called the National Prohibition Party, mimicking the Democrats' fracturing at the moment. They nominated Charles Bentley for president and NC State Party Chairman James Southgate to be his running mate. The Levering ticket got 0.94% of the popular vote, while the Bentley ticket got 0.1% of the popular vote. It's now the 20th century, so maybe it's time for the Prohibitionists to put the pedal to the metal and finally get some major wins. The first major win 
came from the National Prohibition Party merging back to the OG Prohibition Party. As a concession slash olive branch, the party had adopted some progressivism to the platform. None of that's out of the way. Let's go on to the nomination process. Three people sought the Prohibition Party nomination. 1896 VP, Hale Johnson, Methodist preacher, Silas Swallow, and lawyer, John G. Woolley. However, right before the balloting began, Johnson dropped out of the race, Woolley ended up being the nominee, and former gubernatorial candidate, Henry B. Metcalf was nominated to be his running mate. They ultimately got 1.51% of the popular vote. Later in the 1904 election, the Prohibition Party was paying attention to the Democratic Party's nomination process as they were on their way to nominating Commanding General of the U.S. Army, Nelson A. Miles, for president. However, one hour before the convention, Miles sent them a telegram saying that he would not accept the Prohibition Party nomination. So they ended up nominating Sela Swallow for president and businessman George Washington Carroll as his running mate. Swallow almost declined the nomination due to his wife's declining health, but she started to get better, so he went on the campaign trail. They ended up getting 1.92% of the popular vote. In 1908, there was a growth in third party activity. Socialist Labor Party, Mitterra Populists, Independence Party, Socialist Party, and of course, the Prohibition Party. The Prohibition Party had nominated prominent party politician and judge Eugene W. Chafin for president and Minister Aaron S. Watkins as his running mate. Chafin was well known for making many speeches decrying the consumption of alcohol and enforcing local prohibition laws in Balkesha, Wisconsin. His campaign called for the prohibition of alcohol, no duh, but he also called for women's suffrage, enforcement of anti-prostitution laws, tougher restrictions on divorce, regulation of tobacco products, and the federal ban of child labor. They ultimately got 1.71% of the popular vote. Now on to the 1912 election, which we all know is a doozy. Chafin and Watkins were easily renominated for their positions, and they got to work. While Chafin did not participate in the big boys fighting amongst each other, he instead focused on doubling the campaign efforts of the Prohibition Party. During the campaign, Chafin delivered 538 speeches in 14 weeks, sometimes doing five a day. One speech, he expressed amazement that the U.S. would wage a civil war over chattel slavery, but would not lift a finger over the bondage alcohol had over the U.S. They ended up getting 1.38% of the popular vote. In the 1914 midterms, the Prohibition Party had its first major victory when Prohibition Party candidate Charles Hiram Randall was elected to California's 9th Congressional District. This was the final push for the Prohibition Party to go into overdrive. The party convinced itself they were going to do well in the next presidential election and were possibly going to win. So the party went ahead and nominated Indiana Governor Frank Hanley to be their candidate and Minister Ira Landreth as his running mate. Hanley's gubernatorial tenure was well known for causing 72 of Indiana's counties to ban all sales of liquor and setting up Flying Squadron of America, a temperance organization that staged nationwide speaking tours. Their ticket ended up getting 1.19% of the popular vote. Meanwhile, in the same election time frame, Sidney Johnson Katz was elected governor of Florida as a prohibitionist, though he was still a registered Democrat during and after his tenure. And it looks like all of their hard work was about to pay off. Now, while the party itself had minor successes in electing people, their speaking tours and political lobbying was finally paying off because on October 28, 1919, the National Prohibition Act which came right out of the Anti-Saloon League and would go into effect January of 1920. So yeah, Prohibition is now a thing. So what does the Prohibition Party do now? Now that the Prohibition Party's main issue was resolved, you'd think they'd disappear. But nope, they decided that it would be best to move the goalpost and focus on campaigning on stricter national enforcement of Prohibition as opposed to the more localized enforcement of prohibition by clergy groups and the KKK. The party went ahead and nominated two-time VP candidate Aaron Watkins for president and New York Senate candidate David Lee Kovlin as its running mate. 
Due to the fact that maintaining prohibition was now kind of a Republican-held issue, considering the Republican Party candidate in this election actually voted for prohibition, the prohibition party only got 0.71% of the popular vote. Meanwhile, Randall lost re-election in his House seat. In between then and 1924, the popularity of Prohibition was shifting, not too much, but at least the two major parties were now seeing their dry and wet factions take over control of the parties, Democrats being slowly taken over by the wet faction, as in people who hated Prohibition, and the Republican Party slowly being taken over by the dry faction, as in Prohibitionists. But I mean, it wasn't too noticeable yet, at least on the Republican side, because this was the first election that the Democrats ran an openly anti-prohibition candidacy. Coolidge didn't really talk about prohibition at all, neither did Robert M. La Follette. So it's up to the prohibition party to be the sober voice in this election. The party ended up nominating former gubernatorial candidate Herman P. Ferris and key WCTU figure Marie C. Berm to be his running mate. Berm was notable for being the first woman on a presidential ticket that could actually vote for herself. Meanwhile, former prohibitionist rep Charles Randall was nominated to be the VP candidate of Gilbert Nations of the anti-Catholic KKK-sponsored American Party. The prohibitionists ended up getting 0.19% of the popular vote, while the American Party got a little under half of that. By the next election, the shift I had mentioned earlier started to become more noticeable. The dry Republicans had pretty much taken over the GOP, while the wet faction had fully dominated the Democratic Party. That made the Prohibition Party contemplate either not running a presidential candidate and endorsing Hubert Hoover's candidacy, or running New York Prohibitionist William F. Varney for the presidency. Varney won by a close margin, and in the VP nomination process, third-party political activist James A. Edgerton narrowly beat out Prohibition Party state rep Frank S. Reagan. The Prohibition Party and its candidates were not at all oblivious to the potential spoiler effect, so they took some extra precautions to try and diminish that. Edgerton wanted the ticket removed from any states that could be close in the presidential election. The California Prohibition Party outright refused to nominate the Varney Edgerton ticket in favor of Hoover, and Varney ran a front porch campaign as opposed to an active campaign. The party ended up getting 0.05% of the popular vote. By 1930, it was evident that Prohibition wasn't working as well as Prohibitions thought it would. Organized crime was going up, illegal alcohol trade was happening, and while poor people couldn't even get a pint of beer unless it was medicinal, rich people didn't at all get affected by Prohibition. The Prohibition Party argued that the rise of organized crime happened due to urbanization rather than alcohol being banned, and the solution was simply stricter Prohibition. The majority of Americans now seemed attracted to the wet opposition's talk of personal liberty, new tax revenues from legal liquor, and the scourge of organized crime. Even Hoover started to pull back from prohibition, which led the party chairman D. Colvin to say, The Republican wet plank supporting the repeal of prohibition means that Mr. Hoover is the most conspicuous turncoat since Benedict Arnold. So, as a sort of response to this, they couldn't simply nominate just a normal prohibitionist. They had to nominate the driest of dries. So the party nominated former Democratic representative William David Upshaw for the presidency, and Frank Reagan was nominated to be his roommate. Many ended up getting 0.21% of the popular vote. One year later, Roosevelt's administration ended prohibition, which was a plus and a minus for the prohibition party. While their biggest major accomplishment fell, that just meant that the party could campaign on it again and become politically relevant again. By 1936, they were ready to try and bring back a better Prohibition era. Unfortunately, nobody really cared because they were focused on the New Deal or trying to bring a better solution to this. Despite this, the Prohibition Party nominated Chairman D. Colvin to be their candidate and distinguished World War I soldier Sergeant York to be his running mate. York declined the nomination so they nominated Minister Claude A. Watson to be his running mate. They ended up receiving 0.08% of the popular vote. Later in 1940, the Prohibition Party nominated entrepreneur Roger Babson as their candidate and livestock feed manufacturer Edgar Moorman to be his running mate. They ended up getting 
0.12% of the popular vote. In between these two elections, the country got into World War II, and people and parties were divided on how to handle strategy in homeland and overseas. The Prohibition Party was like, Nah, we just gotta ban liquor and everything will be fixed. Yeah, from my research, it apparently shows that they didn't really have much care for the war strategy. At least no statements I could find. They nominated Claude Watson to be their presidential nominee, and General Secretary of the American Temperance Society, Floyd C. Carrier, to be his running mate. Carrier later left the ticket due to health issues, and Minister Andrew N. Johnson was nominated as a replacement. During the campaign, Watson, who was a pilot, was denied permission to fly his plane across the U.S. because the war effort made the U.S. ban air flight that they didn't sanction. Reporters actually went to Roosevelt and questioned this decision, making it seem like he was doing this to specifically hinder Claude Watson's presidential ambitions, so Roosevelt later gave a special exception for Watson, who would later end up flying 16,000 miles simply campaigning, they ended up getting 0.16% of the popular vote. Four years later, there were more interesting things that happened in the presidential election, but the Prohibition Party didn't get involved with all that drama, just simply focusing on moving forward. They renominated Claude Watson to be their nominee, and Prohibitionist politician Dale H. Learn was his running mate. There was one interesting thing that happened during the campaign, though. Claude actually sent his wife, Maude Hagen Watson, to the White House to measure the curtains and other interior furnishings, you know, just in case. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Claude knew that sending his wife to measure the drapes was a premature stance of victory, as that was already a well-known political term at the time. He obviously did it just for publicity, but that is a big power move to be honest. The Watson ticket ended up getting 0.21% of the popular vote, though that percentage did not include Claude and his wife, because his wife had misplaced their requested absentee ballots, and when they went to go cast their ballot in person, the ballot office said, Sorry, you already requested absentee ballots, so if you want to vote now, you have to give us your absentee ballots. So yeah, I guess the power move was a little bit premature as well. Most people at this time were not seriously looking at the Prohibition Party as a viable political party anymore. That didn't stop the party from trying to rise back to its former glory, as like every other minor party at the time, it has its crowd. Their attempt this election cycle was to nominate singing cowboy Stuart Hamblin for the presidency and prohibitionist perennial candidate Enoch A. Holtwick as his running mate. I mean, Hamblin was composing for John Wayne movies and was top of the charts at the time, so it was a decent strategy. They ended up getting 0.12% of the popular vote. Four years later, two people sought the Prohibition Party nomination, Enoch Holdwick and 1952 American Vegetarian Party candidate Herbert Holdridge. I'll probably have to explain what the American Vegetarian Party is at a later date. The party ended up nominating Holdwick, and Holdridge was nominated to be their running mate. However, Holdridge was dropped from the ticket after they found out that he was distributing extremely anti-Eisenhower pamphlets at the floor of the Republican Party nominating convention, and... <laughs> Leader Edwin M. Cooper was chosen as a replacement. They ended up getting 0.07% of the popular votes. In the 1960 election, the party went ahead and nominated former president of the National Association of Evangelicals, Rutherford Decker, to be their nominee, and party chairman E. Harold Munn was chosen to be their running mate. They ended up getting 0.07% of the popular vote. Now, of course, we can notice the sharp decline in vote totals for the Prohibition Party. Now we can debate on why that is. The important thing is, the Prohibition Party does not want that. So they need a strategy to resolve that. So their strategy was to nominate a figure that could vigorously campaign as if he were a major party candidate that actually had a chance of winning. Luckily, they had just the guy, Chairman and former VP candidate E. Harold Munn, who himself stated of his campaign, quote, it's a matter of standing for principles and what one believes in. Perennial prohibitionist candidate Mark R. Shaw was nominated to be his running mate. Munn, as stated before, campaigned very aggressively in this election. He campaigned from coast to coast, making appearances in universities as well as TV and radio programs boosting him even more. 
many newspapers loaded his campaign, saying that it's too bad that there wasn't a sufficient organization to see him elected. Munn ended up getting 0.03% of the popular vote. Though his work did pay off a bit, as the party got on the ballot in more states and exit polls show that 1.46% of students voted for Munn. 1968 had the Prohibition Party overshadowed by other minor party candidates, but they still went ahead with campaigning. Munn was easily renominated, and evangelist Roland E. Fisher was chosen to be his running mate. They ended up receiving 0.02% of the popular vote, being beaten out by three parties formed that year and a guy who was being written in in two states. 1972 wasn't much different. The party renominated Munn while electing a new chairman and choosing salesman Marshall E. Uncuffer to be their VP. They ended up receiving 0.02% of the popular vote again having a newly founded party beating them. As we can see, the decline is getting steeper and steeper for the Prohibition Party. Maybe they need to fix something about their party or strategy. Let's see what they thought would work. First came the 1976 election, where they nominated former Maine State Representative Benjamin Bubar for President and Party Chairman Earl Dodge as his running mate. Now, Bubar wanted to raise publicity for his campaign, but Dodge didn't want to take any risks. Their first strategy was to double the number of pages of the official party paper, The National Statesman, in order to sell advertising space, but Dodge said no. Ben then decided to get the services of a public relations firm, but Dodge again said no. So without either of those strategies, he had to campaign on one last campaign strategy. A simple can of Maine moose milk. I don't know how it would work and have like no pictures to show it, but it is reported to have existed. They ended up receiving 0.02% of the popular vote. In 1977, the party decided that maybe it was their name that was making people hesitant to vote for them. So the party decided to change their name to the National Statesman Party for future elections starting with 1980. The party went ahead and renominated Ben and Dodge for their ticket, despite the fact that these two didn't really see eye to eye that much. The ticket ended up receiving 7,206 votes. Later that year, the party then reinstituted the name, the Prohibition Party. Dodge later decided to start a business selling campaign memorabilia called Buttons for Dodge, which apparently went so well that it ended up helping the party financially. We'll put a pin in that for later. Before the election went underway, Earl Dodge suffered a mild heart attack. But if that's not a deterrent for major presidential candidates, why would that deter Dodge? As the Prohibition Party felt that he was the only person who could take the party forward, and as such, he was nominated to be their candidate for president. And parole officer slash perennial prohibitionist candidate Warren C. Martin was nominated as his running mate. They ended up receiving 4,243 votes. Later in the 1988 election, Dodge was easily renominated by the Prohibition Party, and businessman George Ormsby was nominated to be his running mate. Dodge also participated in the Massachusetts Independence Voter Primary slash debate. They ended up receiving 8,002 votes. Later in 1992, the party decided to go ahead and renominate the Dodge Ormsby ticket, and ended up receiving 961 votes. Later in 1996, Dodge easily got renominated by the party and Women's Christian Temperance Union President Rachel Bubar Kelly was chosen to be his running mate. Kelly was actually the sister of former presidential candidate Ben Bubar, and it looks like they got along better than Bubar and Dodge did. This ticket ended up receiving 1,298 votes. The 2000 election kept up with this little tradition by again renominating Dodge for president and also nominating retired aeronautical engineer Dean Watkins as his running mate. Watkins was the grandson of prominent party member Aaron S. Watkins. I don't blame you for getting, look how far we are in the video at this point. Say what you want about the Prohibition Party, they have a very close and loyal base following them. Dodge also ended up seeking the nomination of the Independent American Party, a smaller paleoconservative party. The ticket ended up receiving 208 votes. Before we get into the negatives, let me give you one major success for the Prohibition Party. In 2002, they elected James Hedges to the position of tax assessor for 
Thompson Township, Pennsylvania. It's a start to possibly something greater, so let's see what happens next. First, the party was having many internal struggles, all of which revolving around Earl Dodge. Remember buttons for Dodge? Well, it turns out, what was originally a side project that would help the party with some financial issues was seemingly Dodge's main focus now. That wasn't all. Turns out that Dodge was more likely using party funds for this and other personal endeavors, and when treasurer Earl Higgerson tried to look into the party's account books, Dodge refused, and when he asked about another financial endeavor called the National Prohibition Foundation, Dodge simply said it was, none of your business. Dodge also claimed to need Prohibition Party funds to add an addition to his house that would be used as an office for the party. However, the funds were apparently used for a tool shed in the backyard. And to add salt in the wound, it turns out many of the campaign memorabilia he was selling on his website was stolen from his fellow party members. And to top it all off, Dodge held a meeting at his house, oh sorry, Prohibition Party office, and had declared himself the nominee of the Prohibition Party and Texas National Committeeman Howard Lydic to be his running mate without notifying or even flat out denying entry to party officials. However, James Hedges took charge and decided to take the majority of the party and hold a public meeting expelling Dodge from the party and nominating a ticket of minister and Prohibition activist Gene Monson for president and law enforcement consultant Leroy Plenton as his running mate. Amundsen was very notable for his very blunt way of supporting Prohibition, saying things like, quote, I'm going to fight booze until hell freezes over. Then I'm going to go buy a pair of ice skates and fight it some more. Even going so far as to stand outside liquor stores dressed as the Grim Reaper. Now originally, Dodge had stated that Amundsen had asked Dodge to be his running mate, but was denied the position, saying Gene was, quote, probably a very nice man, but he may not have known exactly what he's getting into. Gene responded by saying Dodge was a good man, but, quote, is not just getting the job done. He's too old. We need to send it to an earlier generation. Since Gene had a larger faction, he had a lot more appearances in the media, being interviewed by the likes of the Associated Press, where he said, I'd rather have 100 Al Capones in every city than alcohol sold in every grocery store. And John Stewart, where he said, the drink is really not for bright people. It cuts the supply of oxygen off to the brain, and that gives you kind of a retarded state. Now these two campaigns were not seen as two different campaigns, but rather which faction was stronger and could lead the party into the future. The Unmanson ticket got 1,944 votes, while the Dodge ticket got 140 votes. So yeah, I think we know who won this battle. Now despite the overall failure of the Dodge faction, they went ahead and renominated Dodge for president in 2008. However, Dodge died of cardiac arrhythmia before the campaign officially went underway, so that pretty much reunified the Prohibition Party going into the 2008 election. The reunified party renominated Gene Admonson for president and Leroy Plenton for VP, though Gene did say Newt Gingrich would be another good choice. Gene again focused his campaign on interviews, even using them to more refine his platform such as supporting the war in Iraq, wanting to enact tougher immigration laws, protecting gun rights, and decreasing government welfare programs. Now, Amundsen said that winning was probably off the table, saying that third-party people do not win, but we say wise things, and win they did not, only getting 655 votes. Now, going into the election, Gene was seen as the perfect candidate for the party, but he died in 2009, so the room was open for the prohibitionists to nominate a new candidate for the 2012 election. Two people ended up seeking the nomination, prominent party member James Hedges and perennial presidential candidate Jack Feller. Both of these two took different approaches to policy. Feller was a far-right conservative, while Hedges was a bit more Christian democratic in his thinking, being pro-environmentalism and even praising the idea of a UK healthcare system. Feller ended up receiving the nomination, and party chairman Toby Davis was nominated to be his running mate. Now, I've done a video about Jack Feller's presidential ambitions before, and there's not much else to say here except that he ended up receiving 518 votes. Later came the 2016 election, 
which we all know had that whole thing about nominating the two most unpopular main party presidential candidates in U.S. history thing. So much like every other third party, Prohibition Party was all set on cashing in on that. The party nominated party chairman, Greg Seltzer, for president, and James Hedges as his running mate. However, Governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, appointed Seltzer to be a part of Maryland's election board. After that, Hedges was chosen to lead the new ticket with businessman Bill Bays being chosen to be his running mate. Hedges also decided to seek the nomination of the American Independent Party, whose nomination he lost to Donald Trump. The hedges Bays ticket received 5,617 votes. Now, of course, we are in the midst of the 2020 election, and as we can tell from the video, they are not giving up now. Three people actively sought the Prohibition Party nomination. Massachusetts Prohibition National Committee member Adam Seaman, who was running a centrist-style campaign that would tackle modern-day issues like net neutrality. Perennial candidate Phil Collins, running as a moderate conservative. And 2016 VP candidate Bill Bays, running as your average paleocon-like prohibitionist. Bays ended up receiving the nomination, and Connie Gammon was nominated to be his running mate. Bays also planned to seek the nomination of the Constitution Party. However, Bays resigned from the nomination because it was discovered that he was a neo-confederate, a view that was deemed too controversial for party members. They later held another nomination process and nominated Connie Gammon for president and Phil Collins as his running mate. However, Gammon later resigned from the nomination due to health concerns, and they held a third nomination convention this time nominating Phil Collins for president and party activist Billy Joe Parker as his running mate. This ticket appears to be sticking as of the time of the recording of this video. They also received the most votes in the American Independent Party primary, but we'll see if they end up nominating Phil Collins or someone else. And with that, we have reached the most recent developments of the longest existing minor party in US politics. So to all you persistent, pretty conservative prohibitionists, Hopefully these 151 years will pay off in the future. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The 15th official Mexican presidential election took place on July 6, 1988. Madrid was different than previous presidents because he was explicitly a market-oriented person in his economics and had taken a very sharp neoliberal turn in his policies, privatizing state-run industries and entering the general agreement on tariffs and trade, which led to inflation to reach 159% by 1987. He also had to deal with disasters like a series of explosions in petroleum tank farms and an 8.0 magnitude earthquake in Mexico City. The earthquake in particular was heavily criticized due to his terrible response. First, he didn't want to send soldiers there to help in the rescue efforts, while telling the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to deny aid from other countries. Then, he sent troops there only to help prevent looting and not rescue people in need. Then, to add salt to the wound, had soldiers help factory owners recover machinery from their factories, rather than removing the bodies of the dead factory workers. Yeah, unsurprisingly, when Mexico hosted the 1986 FIFA Cup, he was booed by his own country. Así como a los espectadores de todos los países, México envía por su conducto a todos los pueblos de la tierra. This, and the raising of proportional seats from 100 to 200, led to a rise in political opposition from the right and the left as evident by the PRI only retaining 292 seats in the Chamber of Duties. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. We'll start with the right-wing opposition. First, the Mexican Democratic Party had nominated party member Gumercindo Magana to be their candidate, but the right-wing opposition was mostly dominated by the PAN, who got very popular in the northeastern part of Mexico thanks to Madrid and the PRI's undemocratic tendencies because all the PAN had to do was emphasize their pro-democracy stances. Their rise in party membership had led to their candidate having a more broader appeal than previous candidates. They nominated businessman 
Manuel Cartier to be their nominee. And now comes the PRI's nomination process. You see, while Madrid was on his way to picking his successor, the PRI was having marital problems. You see, the left wing of the PRI, called the Democratic Current, was attempting to reform the PRI to have conventions to choose their nominee rather than the traditional didazo method that they are used to. The two leaders on this front were Echeverria cabinet member Porfirio Munoz Leto and Governor Michoacan Cartemo Cardenas, as in the son of Lazaro Cardenas. However, Madrid and the PRI did not care and went ahead and nominated Secretary of Programming and Budget Carlos Salinas de Gortari to be their nominee and flat out kicked out all of the members of the Democratic current out of the PRI, with Madrid even saying, as far as I'm concerned, let them go, let them form another party. Now it was technically too late to form a new political party, that didn't stop Cardenas from forming a coalition of political parties to mount a campaign against the PRI. First, the PARM nominated Cardenas to be their candidate, followed by the Party of the Cardenist Front of National Reconstruction, a rebranded Socialist Workers Party, the newly formed Socialist Mexican Party, the Popular Socialist Party, and a couple of smaller left-wing political parties joined together to form the National Democratic Front as a viable left-wing alternative to the PRI. The only other major leftist party to not join the coalition was the Revolutionary Workers Party, which again ran Rosario Ibarra to be the nominee. Now, two decently popular opposition candidates was a scary notion for the PRI, so they had to curb them as much as they can. Clavier especially had a hard time with interviews on government-controlled news networks, so he ended up boycotting them and holding silent protests with tape over his mouth. And at one point during the campaign, Cardenas was able to fill the Plaza del Zocalo with supporters. This election was also notable for being the first to have their election results counted electronically, and he 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 <laughs> Sorry, it looks like there was like a glitch in my video or something. <laughs> Much like on election day. You see, while the results were being counted, Cardenas was in the lead among the candidates. But all of a sudden, the electronic voting system crashed. And when the system went back online, the results showed Gortari with 50.36% of the popular vote, Cardenas with 31.12% of the popular vote, Clatier with 17.07% of the popular vote, Magana with 1.04% of the popular vote, and Ibarra with 0.42% of the popular vote. And in the Chamber of Duties, 260 seats went to the PRI, 139 went to the National Democratic Front, and 101 went to the National Action Party. Cardenas, Clatier, and Ibarra decried this and signed a document saying that they would not accept the election results. A PAN official also apparently got the original file with the real results and got evicted from his position in the Federal Elections Commission. Clatier and the PAN followed up with a 20,000 person protest and asked their supporters to initiate a 177 hour hunger strike. In fact, many modern Mexican historians stated that if Cardenas gave the order, he could have set Mexico up in flames, but like his father, he was not a man of violence. So inevitably, the people moved on. Though many people state that it wasn't the system that truly crashed, it was Mexico's political system, and the term Sicario el Sistema has become a political term in Mexico that means pretty much just rigging an election. But the question you may be wondering is, was all of this justified? Well, if you aren't convinced yet, let me give you three events that happened afterwards that may sway you to see where Cardenas was coming from. First, in 1991, the PRI and the PAN passed a resolution in the Chamber of Duties to burn the ballots used in the 1980 elections, effectively destroying the only thing that could prove or disprove the accusations. In 2019, the American Political Science Review found evidence of blatant alterations in about one-third of the tallies done in the election, and in a 2004 interview and autobiography, De La Madrid blatantly admitted that he rigged the election. So yeah, now that we have proof the PRI isn't in the safe position as we thought, 
Let's see how the opposition handles that in the next election. Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. Ever since the Merrick Garland and Brett Kavanaugh situations, we've been hearing many, many people advocate for the, quote, depoliticization of the Supreme Court in a variety of ways, ranging from court packing, term limits, to switching the judges around with lower courts, among other things. Now, of course, we can debate all day long on how we can reform the Supreme Court, how these different things would work, but I want to focus on one argument that always bugs me when they talk about it. They want to make these efforts to, quote, depoliticize the Supreme Court. Can you depoliticize the Supreme Court? I don't, I don't think so, not really. Let me explain why. First, let's tackle the first argument on many people saying, well, we can just simply pack the courts to depoliticize it. Okay, how would that depoliticize the court? Literally, all you're doing is adding more justices of your political ideology. Remember, FDR wanted to add six justices to the Supreme Court because the nine that were currently on the court were holding back his political ideology. And doesn't that set a dangerous precedent for people who you don't like politically? It's one thing people think about with the short-mindedness of their political viewpoints. If you're a Democrat and you hear a Democrat say, we're going to add six more justices to the court, you scream, hooray, because guess who's going to appoint those justices? The Democrats. But if a Republican says that exact same thing, you're not going to be so happy about it, and vice versa. And eventually... If these people just keep adding justices to the court, you're just going to get another chamber in the legislative branch. The only difference being that they'd be appointed, not elected. Now that we're on a tirade about political viewpoints, we need to tackle that aspect of the court as well. You see, justices are not, you know, objective computers. They're humans just like us. They're going to have different judicial and political viewpoints in regards to the law. Even if they've been working in the judicial system for like 20 years. I mean, think about it. Just because you and someone else go into the same poli-sci course for like a year, doesn't necessarily mean you and that same student are going to have the same political viewpoint. You might, but it's not a guarantee. Everybody's going to have many different things that shape their viewpoints. And these justices are not any different. The only difference is they have experience putting their viewpoints into action, debating on Twitter, doing silly little political videos. I mean, this isn't traffic court. There isn't objective rights and wrong. The Supreme Court handles cases that debate the constitutionality of certain laws. And the thing is, the Constitution is not cut and dry. Like every other thing in our politics, it is debated. Is it strict? Is it loose? Do we amend it every so often? Do we keep it the same no matter what happens? And the political viewpoints that you have in your head now can shape how you view the Constitution. I mean, the people who put pen and paper to write the Constitution couldn't even agree on how they would view it. What makes you think justices, like 200 years after the Constitution was written, can come to an objective consensus, whereas the writers couldn't? Need we forget, the Supreme Court is not separate from government, it's the third branch of it. Being political is kind of the job of the government. You can't ask for the Senate to be depoliticized because that's kind of their job. I mean, think about it. Ever since the SCOTUS case Roe v. Wade, literally every single Supreme Court justice has been asked what are you going to do about this particular big issue? It's pretty obvious that people want to uphold their own political viewpoint via justices. You know, as a branch of the government is supposed to do. My final point is something many people don't realize. People think the politicization of the Supreme Court justices is a newer development, when that has never been the case. 
Like, let's look back at many of the Scottish judges' other endeavors. Charles Evan Hughes, governor turned Scottish turned presidential candidate. David Davis, Scottish turned presidential candidate. Salmon P. Chase, governor, senator, chief justice, presidential candidate. Earl Warren, governor, presidential candidate, chief justice. William Howard Taft, president, then chief justice. Even John freaking Jay, who served as the first chief justice of the Supreme Court before becoming governor of New York. You, 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 you kind of get my point. The court was actually way more political back in the day, since justices were okay with running for political office and not tarnishing their, quote, objectiveness, because they accepted that ideology plays a part on how government officials dictate policy. This sentiment even somewhat continues to this day, as many people float SCOTUS justices for president, or some talking about issues outside of the robe. Now again, this is not to knock any attempts to reform the Supreme Court. I, in fact, feel that many reforms could be beneficial. But I am literally just playing semantics with the idea of depoliticizing the court, because, let's be honest, that's never gonna happen. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The 16th official Mexican presidential election took place on August 21st, 1984. Gortari took Mexico to an even more neoliberal turn than before. His inauguration emphasized his goals to modernize Mexico, and the first thing he did after his inauguration was jail prominent union leaders who were opposed to him. He also privatized many state run enterprises. He also began the precursor of what would eventually become the Mexican drug war, and made many efforts to try and diminish the power of his right wing and left wing opponents by removing the anti clerical parts of the 1917 constitution to appeal to right wingers and creating a social welfare program called the National Solidarity Program to appeal to left-wingers. But the biggest thing that happened during the last year of his term was Mexico joining the North American Free Trade Agreement. The implementation of it led to the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, a far-left libertarian socialist military group, to coordinate a 12-day uprising in the state of Chiapas, which ultimately ended with the Zapatistas getting their own autonomous area in Mexico. Meanwhile, in electoral news, there were a couple of parties that rose up in the intervening time. A socialist party called the Labour Party, and a green conservative party called the Ecological Green Party of Mexico. Though the most prevalent one, being the National Democratic Front, transforming into a new political party called the Party of the Democratic Revolution. And in the midterms, the Chamber of Duties had 180 seats in the opposition of the PRI. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. Since we're approaching the end of this series, I've decided to suspend the 1% vote rule so I can talk about all 9 candidates in this election. First, we have something notable. The PARM officially decided to run their own candidates. Nominating party member Alvaro Perez Trevino running under the slogan, Victory is Ours. Second is 1982 PAN presidential candidate Pablo Emilio Madero making a second run for the presidency this time running with the Mexican Democratic Party. He ran under the slogan, Democracy is our homeland. Third was former Chamber of Duty members, Marcela Lombardo Ortero of the Popular Socialist Party. She was the daughter of the party founder and first presidential candidate of the PPS, Vicente Lombardo. She ran under the slogan, The choice is yours. The next was former student activist and political prisoner, Rafael Aguilar Talamantes, running with the Party of the Cardinalist Front of National Reconstruction. He ran under the slogan, Legitimate Government. Next was the Ecologist Green Party of Mexico, who nominated party leader, Jorge Gonzalez Torres. He ran under the slogan, Don't Vote for a Politician. Next candidate was former PARM member of the Chamber of Duties, Cecilia Soto Gonzalez, representing the Labor Party. She ran under the slogan, Women's Party. While those candidates were there and ran, it was really just a three-person race. First, we have the Party of the Democratic Revolution, who nominated Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas to make another run for the presidency, who was still coming off the popularity of his last run. Running under the slogan, 
democracy, justice, and freedom. Second, the National Action Party, who nominated former Chamber of Duties member Diego Fernandez de Ceballos, trying to reclaim the title of the PRI's main opposition, running under the slogan, The Only Sure Change. And lastly came the PRI nomination, which was rather interesting. Gordotari could have listened to the cries of the last election and moved the PRI to a more democratic way of choosing a nominee, but he decided, nah. It was expected that he would pick the mayor of Mexico City, Manuel Camacho Solis, for the job. However, he chose Secretary of Social Development, Luis Donaldo Colosio, instead. Solis then resigned from his position in protest. Soon in response, he was appointed to a position in Gortari's administration, which inevitably made him become the mediator during the Zapatista conflict, which just raised his profile even more so. So much so, that Gortari had to remind people in the media that Solis was not the candidate. Early in the campaign, Colosio wasn't doing so hot, so he decided to distance himself from the current administration and cozy up to a new crowd, making a speech on the PRI's anniversary that echoed many of the Zapatistas' platform of combating government abuse, supporting indigenous peoples, and independence from the government. He even promised an open dialogue with the Zapatistas. Wow, this is actually an interesting development. Maybe the PRI is going to change itself for the better now. But then, on March 23rd, after hosting a campaign rally in Tijuana, Colosio was assassinated by Mario Alberto Martinez. The assassination is pretty much a Mexican JFK assassination, as there's many conspiracy theories claiming involvement from outside forces. The most prevalent theory being that Gortari was the one who ordered his assassination due to the distancing of his campaign and criticism of the current administration. After a three-day period of mourning slash holding of the campaign, Gortari chose former Secretary of Energy and Colosio's campaign manager, Ernesto Zedillo, as a replacement. Zedillo never held political office before, and was seen as a weaker candidate than Colosio, which led to those same theorists to liken it to when former President Plutarco Caius picked people he could vicariously control after Alvaro Obregón's assassination. Despite all these theories, Zedillo moved forward with the slogan, Well-being for your family. This election is also notable for being the first election in Mexican history where the candidates debated each other. Zedillo, Ceballos, and Cardenas were invited to a televised debate that was watched by 34 million Mexicans. The person who was considered the winner of the night was Ceballos for relentlessly going after the two candidates, saying about Cardenas, que si tenemos que creerle los mexicanos a usted, que es una opción democrática, Tendríamos que creerle a Aburto, que es pacifista. And said to Zedillo, Sabemos que usted ha sido un buen chico con altas calificaciones. Pero en democracia, creemos que sinceramente no aprueba. That debate was seen as changing the dynamics, as now Sibelius was seen as the biggest opposition to Zedillo, and Cardenas was now the third wheel. But for some reason, after the debate, Sibelius kind of disappeared from the media. What took his place was the PRI-controlled media, saying that changing the ruling party during these trying times was a bad idea, and Cardenas was a violent radical. And here are the results. Unsurprisingly, Zedillo won with 50.13% of the popular vote. Ceballos got 26.69% of the vote. Cardenas got 17.07% of the vote. Gonzalez got 2.83% of the vote. Torres got... 0.95% of the vote, Aguilar got 0.87% of the vote, Trevino got 0.56% of the vote, Lombardo got 0.49% of the vote, and Madero got 0.29% of the vote. Cardenas contested the election results, but it appears no one else joined him, presumably due to apathy of the PRI's rigging. In the Chamber of Duties, all but four parties were electorally wiped out. The Labour Party winning 10 seats, the Party of the Democratic Revolution with 71 seats, the National Action Party with 119 seats, and the PRI with 300 seats. 
This was the last election where one party won every state in the country. As we could see, the opposition is rising and coalescing, but the PRI has too much power to be kicked off of their pedestal, so the opposition might as well stick to second best. Right? Te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified in the future video when it comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, follow my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. On September 30th, 1920, Charles Arthur Morris was born 35 miles outside of Birmingham, Alabama. He lived with his divorced mother and brother until the age of five, when his mother couldn't take care of them anymore and put them in a state orphanage. He was then adopted by the P.A. Woods family at age six and moved to Hollywood, California. He enlisted in the Royal Canadian Air Force and the U.S. Army Air Corps in 1941, eventually working his way up to major in a few years. He frequently had to make a trip to deliver 28,000 pounds of fuel from India to China hundreds of times over his career. However, on December 23, 1944, he was ordered to make this trip again with a pilot in training named Captain Stalmacher. Stalmacher, however, messed up on takeoff, causing them to crash. Charles was the only survivor. Though he suffered severe burns on 70% of his body, he had a risky operation done on him where the skin of a recently deceased soldier was draped over his, you know, with the soldier's family approving of the procedure. While his body would normally reject the skin in 14 days, causing him to die, it actually lasted around a month, just long enough to save his life. He was later operated on 24 times in the next 4 years, mostly to reconstruct his face and often with very little anesthesia. This is how he looked after the operations, but he didn't let that put him down, he's a soldier, he pushes forward. He later moved on to have careers in construction and radio, owning WTVY in its early years up to 2000, but that's a little bit ahead of itself, so let's go back to the past. It's gonna take you back to the past. His first forte into electoral politics was running for governor of Alabama in 1966 against Lurleen Wallace, wife of George Wallace, as well as a couple of other state officials. He made himself known for his long-form self-purchased television campaign commercials. He ended up getting 4.63% of the popular vote. He then became a perennial candidate for various offices in the coming years. He next ran for office in 1970 when he made another run for governor, this time running against incumbent Governor Albert Brewer, former Governor Jim Folsom, KKK leader and former Wallace supporter Asa Carter, and Wallace himself. Woods ended up getting 14.71% of the vote. Not getting enough to make it into the Wallace Brewer runoff, but he was the best performing candidate that did not make it to the runoff. Two years later, he attempted to run for Alabama District 2, getting 21.77% of the votes. Two years later, he announced that he would primary incumbent Democratic Lieutenant Governor Jeer Baisley, and he ended up receiving 38.68% of the vote, which was a plurality of the vote, but just enough to trigger a runoff, which he never be lost with 43.9% of the vote. He attempted to run for governor again in 1978, only getting 700 votes. Afterwards, he returned to his business life. He later re-entered politics in 1992, when he initiated a long-shot bid for the Democratic nomination for president. His campaign emphasized his experience in business, saying, The U.S. government is the biggest business in the world. I think we need a businessman to run it. His slogan was, The Businessman's Approach. His Southern populist platform emphasized his support for the working class Americans, calling out the top 1%, and even calling for a national health care plan for all Americans. He ended up getting 0.44% of the vote in the primary. His best showing was in North Dakota, where he got 20.26% of the votes. Around that same time, he ran for Senator of Nevada against incumbent Senator Harry Reid, getting 39.4% of the votes. Two years later, probably due to his lackluster results in the Democratic Party, he decided to switch his party affiliation to the GOP and ran for Nevada's other Senate seat, getting 25.52% of the vote. He later returned to his home state of Alabama to primary incumbent Senator Jeff Sessions. In a crowded field, he got 11.2% of the vote, again not making it to the runoff, 
but performing the best of those who didn't. He pretty much returned to private life until 2000 when he retired from his business life and became the Democratic nominee in Alabama District 2 against Republican Representative Terry Everett. He ended up getting 29.18% of the votes. He made his last run for public office in 2002 when he initiated a rematch against Everett, this time getting 29.52% of the votes. Woods later succumbed to his illnesses and passed away on October 17, 2004. His opponent, Jeff Sessions, later paid tribute to him in the Senate. Now, Woods may not have been too much in the U.S. political scene, but I feel that his interesting story still deserves to be told. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow my Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, join my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. El Plebles Unum Presentas Elecciones Presidenciales en la Historia Mexicana The 17th official presidential election in Mexican history took place on July 2nd, 2000. Fun fact. This was one day before I was born. Anyways, Cedillo was not doing so hard when he first got elected. A few days after entering office, Mexico suffered a huge economic crisis brought on by the peso being devalued with the US dollar. And while this was the fault of the previous administration, Cedillo was the one who ended up getting the blame. He was also able to get a $20 billion loan from the US to fix the issue. He also faced an issue with the fact that he was still seen as a weak puppet president being controlled by Gortari, so Zedillo started distancing himself from Gortari, culminating with the arrest of Gortari's brother for murdering PRI Secretary General Jose Francisco Ruiz Maciu. Also, the Zapatistas were not fully satiated from their last conflict, and there was another uprising in 1995. Zedillo was also starting a conflict with the Catholic Church. As it turns out, bishops were getting involved with and covering for the Zapatistas in an effort to be a middleman during the conflict. The PRD's leadership was also helpful in the negotiations. He also made a new poverty alleviation program to help the poorest families as long as their kids went to school, and led on some electoral reform by creating an autonomous organization to oversee the elections and made the head of Mexico City an elected position, which was won by Cardenas easily, and created a group that would oversee campaign spending. Speaking of electoral politics, the midterms had an interesting development as this was the first election that the PRI did not win a majority of seats in the Chamber of Duties, just a plurality. Some new parties were formed in the meantime, but we'll get to them soon enough. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. First, there was a familiar face, former cabinet member to Portillo and Echeverria and PRD founder Porfirio Munoz Leto. He originally wanted to run as the candidate of the party of the Democratic Revolution, as he was the party co-founder, but the PRD leadership was like, nah, you know you're not going to be the candidate, so why even bother? So, he claimed that the PRD leadership was corrupt and left the party to become the candidate of the PARM. He ran under the motto, Porfirio Yes Complies. Second was another familiar face, Manuel Camacho Solis, running under a new party he created called the Party of the Democratic Center. A new centrist political party, you know, think of it as the Mexican Reform Party. Solis ran under the motto, only one Mexico, let's defend it. Third was political activist Gilberto Rinchun Gallard, running under a new party called Social Democracy, a social democratic party founded by members of the PRD who left due to internal party struggles. Though he did face a challenge by activist and former Chamber of Duties candidate Patricia Mercado, he ran under the slogan, Let's Give a Rose to Mexico. But, much like last time, this was mostly a three-person race. First was Cárdenas, running for the presidency a third time, bringing back something from his first run, an electoral alliance. Forming the Alliance for Mexico with the Party of the Democratic Revolution, the Labour Party, a small left-wing nationalist party called the Party of the Nationalist Society, and a new party founded by the left-wing PRI dissidents called Convergence for Democracy. He ran under the slogan, For Mexico to Victory. The second alliance to form was the Alliance for Change, which was formed by the PAN and the Mexican Green Party. 
Despite some opposition by the PAN, they nominated former Chamber of Duties member and governor of Guanajuato, Vincente Fox. He ran under the slogan, The Change That Suits You. And lastly came the coalition of the PRI and the PRI. Yeah, surprisingly, being in power for 70 years means you don't really need to form a new coalition. But you see, one thing was notably different from the last election. You see, due to the reforms that Zadio made, they couldn't just pick their successor by the old Didazo method. So now, they had to hold a presidential primary to nominate their candidates. Four candidates ended up seeking the PRI's nomination. First was former president of the Chamber of Duties, Humberto Roque Villanueva. Second was the controversial governor of Puebla, Manuel Barlet Diaz. Controversial because in 1985, he was involved with the decision to order the kidnap, torture, and murder of American DAA officer Enrique Camarena to protect the Gu Guadalajara cartel. Third was governor of Tabasco, Roberto Madrazo Pintado. And fourth was cabinet member for Madrid and Zedillo, Francisco Labastida, who was seen as the unofficial Didazo candidate. The primary was heavily contested between Madrazo and Labastida. Madrazo aggressively campaigned against the heads of the party, using his name as a pun, saying that he'd deal a Madrazo against the Didazo. He got a hefty amount of support from the average PRA members, but the primary favored the preferred candidate of La Pastita, and as such, he won the nomination. Running under the slogan, May Power Serve the People. If the PRI primary was any indication, this election was going to get nasty. The PRI was the weakest it has been in its 71 years of power. The opposition is not going to let this opportunity pass by. Cardenas and Fox campaigned aggressively against La Pastita. Cardenas focusing on his policy planks because he was still considered the third wheel in this hypothetical tricycle. Fox, being seen as the leading opposition candidate with more to lose, had a campaign more aggressively, calling La Bastida, La Vestida, which implied that he was a cross-dresser, and despite the fact that he was a well-off governor from a decently well-off state, he traded his business suit for a cowboy hat and boots to come off more populist. This came to a head in the first presidential debate of the cycle, having all six candidates in attendance to debate. The major takeaways from this debate were that La Bastida was the biggest loser of the night and Fox was the biggest winner of the night. However, his win was handicapped slightly as the debate aired on a PRI-controlled channel. The next debate was planned to be a bit different. Fox wanted a more open program on all channels with a more flexible format featuring three interviewers, Whereas the other two candidates invited to the debate, La Bastida and Curtinus, insisted on a more traditional format with a single moderator and live coverage only on two small stations. This led to the debate inevitably being delayed from Tuesday to Friday because they couldn't end up agreeing on what to do, each candidate blaming each other for the debate falling through. However, during all this controversy, Fox was seen as the most reasonable when he made an address stating, we don't care about the height of the podiums or what snacks they serve in the VIP suites. We just want an open debate. La Bastida and Cardenas invited Fox to a meeting the day of the debate was scheduled to iron out the details, but it was inevitably just a shouting match between the candidates, culminating with Fox just slamming his hand on the desk and saying, Oi, oi, oi. The PRI media spun this as Fox being childish and instringent, so Fox inevitably agreed to the debate on their terms. A debate that he was again seen as the winner of. When he first came to the debate, people were chanting, Death to Fox. But when he left, they were chanting, Oi, oi, oi. Fox was so confident in the people liking him, that he stated that it wasn't even a matter of if the people voted for him, but if the PRI would just flat out steal this election. The polls for this election had originally shown mostly La Bastida victories, but now showed him and Fox consistently swamping for first and second place. Fox's jump in the polls even compelled Munoz Leto to drop out and endorse him to help the PRI's opposition. Though he'd remain on the ballot due to his late exit and the PRM wanting to not lose their ballot line. The PRI was so worried that they would have a blowout 
They even gave people who pledged to vote for the PRI care packages that would contain rice, beans, chocolate, among other things. In fact, former president Jose Portillo decided he would come out of retirement and make an official endorsement for the 2000 presidential election. Oh wait, no, 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 you see, I was actually mistaken. You see, he didn't endorse anybody in the 2000 Mexican presidential election. He endorsed someone in the 2000 US presidential election, Lyndon LaRouche. Okay then. And here are the results. In an actual surprise, Vincente Fox won with 42.52% of the popular vote. La Bastida got 36.11% of the vote. Cardenas got 16.64% of the vote. Gallardo got 1.58% of the vote. Camacho got 0.55% of the vote. And Munoz got 0.42% of the vote. Into the Chamber of Duties, the Alliance for Change got 224 seats. The PRI got 208 seats, and the Alliance for Mexico got 65 seats. Zadillo was on TV that night, congratulating Fox on his win, which angered many prominent old guard PRIistas who saw Zadillo as a traitor, and there were even concerns that they may lead to a violent uprising against the Fox government. But thankfully that didn't end up happening. This election was notable for obviously being the first where an opposition candidate won, and ended the PRI's 70 year long reign. Will Fox bring new fantastic changes to Mexico's political scene? Well, te veré para las próximas elecciones amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quarter, join my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. Neoconservatism is a political ideology that was born in the 1960s, brought on by the Cold War as well as the rise of the New Left counterculture movement. The term neoconservatism was coined by DSA founder Michael Harrington. Although it of course is called neoconservatism, the roots of the ideology actually come from very strange beginnings. As it turns out, many of the earliest people to be associated with the neoconservative movement were liberal hawks within the Democratic Party and the right wing of the Socialist Party, mixed with Trotsky's theorists who were disillusioned with the direction the New Left was going in. In fact, many Trotskyists and Socialists in the 60s would end up becoming prominent neocons in the 70s and 80s, and were in fact one of the many prime movers of the ideology. Why were many of these guys so ready to jump ideologies? Well, they were mostly concerned with the rise of Stalin-style communism and hated the New Left didn't want to take them down. While the ideology was of course focused on mostly foreign policy, they gradually introduced other parts of the ideology to combat the New Left. Pretty much everything the New Left was for, neocons were against. New Left was pro-peace, neocons were pro-war. New Left likes weed, neocons are pro-drug prohibition. New Left liked a fair economy built from the bottom up. Neocons favored free markets and supply-side economics. New Left accepts the LGBT community, neocons are very socially conservative, etc, etc. They of course had many disagreements with the New Left, but also had major divisions with the more paleoconservative old right with issues such as trade. As such, the rise of neoconservatism is also known as the rise of the new right. The first election that where we saw neoconservatism play a major part was the 1964 election where Barry Goldwater took a huge neoconservative turn in his foreign policy. Though of course still had some old right tendencies. Some politicians and figures labeled as neocons are former VP, Chief of Staff, Bill Crystal, whose dad was a Trotskyist turned granddad of neocons, former Senator John McCain, former VP Dick Cheney, political commentator Ben Shapiro, but most prevalently former President George W. Bush. And the parties that adhere to neoconservatism are the Conservative Party in the UK, the Serve America movement, and of course, the Republican Party. Though it appears that they may be taking a more paleocon right-wing populist route given the rise of Donald Trump, and will now be a bit of a mix between neocons and old right and libertarians, much like how the Democratic Party is now kind of like this jumble of neolibs, socialists, and whoever else. 
Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow my Facebook, Twitter, or Quarter. You can join my Discord or check out my articles on the independent political report. El player bless unum presentas Elecciones presidenciales en la historia mexicana The 18th official presidential election in Mexican history took place on July 2nd, 2006. Vicente Fox ran a populist campaign and ended the PRI's reign over Mexico. And what did he do with the power he now had? Mostly continue Mexico's neoliberal policies, but shift them further to the right. The beginning of his tenure was mostly defined by failing to institute a value-added tax in Mexico, failing to build an airport in Texcoco, and the creation of the free trade area of the Americas, which made him have a rocky relationship with Cuba, Venezuela, and Bolivia, and covering up the death of the journalist Digna Ochoa. The latter half was mostly defined by his conflict with the head of government of Mexico City, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, where Fox tried to impeach him and remove his civil rights, which would include voting rights and his right to run for public office. But after one million people came to Obrador's support, Fox dropped the charges. Why did he try to do this, you may ask? Well, it was supposedly to help a guy who wasn't properly reimbursed for federally purchased land. There was another reason why he did it, which you may or may not know at this point. In the 2003 midterms, the PRI had retaken the Chamber of Duties. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. First, we'll start off with two new parties that arose between the last election and now. First was the Social Democratic and Peasant Alternative Party, which was a reformed social democracy, which had now defined itself as a party of the new left and had a platform of legalizing same-sex marriage, euthanasia, decriminalizing certain drugs, and ending the influence of the Catholic Church. Activist Patricia Mercado ran as the candidate. She ran under the slogan, A Woman's World. The other one being the New Alliance Party, a liberal political party that split from the PRI. They ran former Chamber of Duties member and lawyer Roberto Campa as the candidate. He ran under the slogan, One out of three, which was referring to him wanting people to give one of their three votes in the election to the New Alliance Party. Speaking of the PRI, that PRI exit occurred over the presidential primary. Roberto Madrazo, who was now the leader of the PRI, was running for the nomination a second time, and many PRI members tried to run an insurgent campaign against him as a group called the Democratic Unity. They ran Governor of Mexico State Arturo Montiel as their candidate, but he quickly dropped out due to embezzlement charges. There was another opposition candidate in former Assistant Attorney General Everardo Moreno Cruz, but ultimately Madrazo ended up being the nominee. He ran under the slogan, Madrazo also formed a coalition with the Mexican Green Party after they broke with the PAN. The coalition was called the Alliance for Mexico. Hey, wait a minute. While we're on the subject, what was the PRD up to? Well, it was assumed that Cardenas would run for the presidency a fourth time, but before the PRD would hold an official presidential primary, they would hold an internal party poll to see who actually has support amongst the party members. The internal party poll showed that another member of the party was supported by 90% of the party. That person being Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. I'll be using his nickname AMLO from here on out. Due to that, Cardenas decided not to seek the party's nomination and AMLO ran unopposed. He formed a coalition with Convergence, a rebranded Convergence for Democracy, and the Labour Party called the Coalition for the Good of All, he ran under the slogan, For the good of all, the poor are first. And lastly came the PAN. Following the successful overthrow of the PRA, they got reinvigorated to run a very serious campaign. There were three people who sought the presidential nomination. Former Secretary of the Environment, Alberto Cardenas Jimenez. Former Secretary of the Interior, Santiago Criel Miranda. And former Secretary of Energy, Felipe Calderon. Now despite the fact that Miranda was endorsed by Vincente Fox, Calderon ended up winning the nomination. They did not have a coalition this election and ran under the slogan, So we can live better. 
Oh, silly me. I forget about the candidacy of Dr. Simi. Okay, let me explain. Mexican businessman Victor Gonzalez Torres decided to initiate an independent presidential campaign as the mascot of his pharmacy chain, running under the slogan, To serve God and the people of Mexico. However, independents were not allowed to run for president, so he had to run an unofficial write-in candidacy. All that really happened with his candidacy was that he tried to enter the debate, even bringing his own chair, and he tried to claim the title of the cheapest candidate in the race due to his self-finance campaign, but courts ruled that Mercado was the officially cheapest candidate. I just thought it was like a fun little tidbit. The campaign was seen as another two-person plus one race, but not who we expect. You see, the PRI was now coming in third in all of the polls, so it didn't look like he would be a major factor in the race. So much so, that Madrazo even stated that the PRI was open to merging his coalition with AMLO's, AMLO said that he wanted to keep his message pure, so that was not going to happen. AMLO faced scrutiny from both sides of the political aisle. He faced scrutiny from the left for including people such as Manuel Camacho Solis in his campaign when Camacho was not a leftist. Zapatista leader, Subcomandante Marcos, even flat out claimed that AMLO was a false leftist. Meanwhile, the right wing of Mexico likened him to Hugo Chavez even claiming that Chavez was distributing pro-AMLO propaganda in Mexico in an effort to sway the election. Now despite the fact that AMLO was the slight frontrunner of the bunch, he neglected to participate in the first presidential debate. The remaining candidates decided to leave an empty chair on the stage to signify his absence. The consensus following the debate was that Calderon was the winner, Mercado was a pleasant surprise, Campa did well, Madrazo was the overall loser, and AMLO should have been there. The second debate was more of a mixed bag, some media groups saying Calderon won, some saying the winner was AMLO, which was very similar to the polls, some said AMLO was the winner, some said Calderon was the winner, but it was pretty clear it was these two and everyone else was just there. And here are the results. Well, there's an interesting debacle. You see, on the night of the election, the race was too close to call. Well, I mean, unless you were Calderon and AMLO, who both called themselves the winner of the night. But media groups and the official election center could not do so. It didn't help that this would be the first time Mexican citizens living abroad could vote in the presidential election. The preliminary results that were being counted showed AMLO leading by decimals for a while, but as soon as the results got to 98% of the vote, Calderon jumped to a 1.04% lead. Pretty soon, the official results came in, and the results were Calderon winning with 35.89% of the vote, AMLO with 35.31% of the vote, Madrazo with 21.26% of the vote, Mercado with 2.7% of the vote, and Campa with 0.96% of the vote. AMLO criticized this as there were many voting irregularities across at least 30 states, and he would push for a full recount. This debacle continued for two months, even having the EU get involved to help solidify the results. Eventually, a partial recount was done, which had 6% of the votes counted invalidated, AMLO saying that this is more evidence that there should be a full recount because the results just kept putting them closer and closer. The EU had published a report officially recognizing Calderon as the winner, but also gave suggestions for electoral reform to prevent this from happening again, including moving to a top two runoff style like other Latin American countries and very openly clarifying what would constitute a recount. In November of that year, AMLO held a rally of supporters to declare him the legitimate president of Mexico and announced plans to build a shadow cabinet to exert political pressure on Calderon's actual cabinet. Will Calderon institute any of these reforms that were suggested? Will this be the end of AMLO's political career? Well, te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, follow my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The Tea Party movement was a right-wing populist political movement within the United States. It takes its name from both the Boston Tea Party 
and it being an acronym for Taxed Enough Already. The movement was mixed in regards to its ideology ever since its founding, but let's go back to the beginning. The Tea Party was credited by beginning as early as 2002 as a website started by the Koch Bros founded group Citizens for a Sound Economy, though of course its more formal founding is attributed to Ron Paul's 2008 presidential campaign and the subsequent election of Barack Obama, though some more attributed to the direct calling for a Tea Party by CNBC newscaster Rick Santilli on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Beginning in 2009, people known as teabaggers started protesting to bring these issues to light. They were less organized at first, but it slowly started to get more formally organized by the 2010 midterms, even having a congressional caucus at the time. At the time of the midterms, it was reported that 130 candidates were at least somewhat affiliated with the Tea Party movement. How did they get organized so fast? Well, the Koch brothers, through their political advocacy group, Americans for Prosperity, gave Tea Party groups and politicians $45 million during the election cycles. And the Tea Party was rather successful, much like the Republican Revolution of 1994, pretty much helping them retake the House. And while they didn't flip the Senate, the Tea Party made itself known by primarying and elected high-profile Senate candidates with Rand Paul, Mike Lee, Marco Rubio, and Scott Walker. So yeah, they were forced to be reckoned with going into 2012. They were obviously going to play a huge part in the GOP's presidential primary and races all across the country, right? Well, it was reported that they did worse in down-the-ballot races, with many Tea Party favorites losing races, but still having a decent amount of wins in the Texas Senate race, but the bigger focus was if the momentum would translate to the presidential race. It definitely translated to many presidential candidates trying to appeal to the Tea Party. Ron Paul, Herman Cain, Michelle Bachman, Newt Gingrich, and Gary Johnson trying to be the ideal Tea Party Republican to take the movement to the presidency. Heck, there were even two Democrats that tried to appeal to the Tea Party. Well, of course, none of them won. The GOP did try to give an olive branch to the movement, with Paul Ryan being seen as a Tea Party favorite. And Gary Johnson and Virgil Good gave Tea Partiers a choice in the general election. By this time, the movement was starting to get wildly disorganized and was quickly dying. But even when they tried to get more formally organized, things didn't necessarily go so hot. As in 2013, it was revealed that the IRS was targeting political groups seeking tax exemption for intensive scrutiny based on their names and themes. The two most targeted terms were the terms Tea Party and Occupy. And the Tea Party didn't really seem to come back to full force until the 2016 presidential election. I mean, four people who were elected to office because of the Tea Party were running for president. I'd say the Tea Party was well on its way to completely changing the GOP. Now, did any of them win the Tea Party support? <laughs> no, because remember, the Tea Party movement is a populist right movement, and by this time, all of these folks had become part of the political establishment. So, they weren't necessarily keen on these guys. They were keen on someone else who was running for president at the time. In fact, he was so much of the ideal choice of the Tea Party that he overwhelmingly won the primary and the general election. But as someone who kind of grew up with the Tea Party movement being somewhat of a thing in his childhood, the one question that is on my mind is, whatever happened to the Tea Party? Well, there was no formal disillusion of the movement, but considering the movement was able to accomplish its main goal of replacing Barack Obama with a person who identified with the Tea Party movement, and the populist pendulum now shifting to the left side of the political spectrum with the rise of Bernie Sanders, the Tea Party movement has pretty much dissipated. Though, of course, it still has people who seem quite Tea Party-esque in Congress. Will the movement make a full recovery in 2024? We don't know, and we'll have to find out when that happens. 
Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Core, join me on Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. Ah, the 60s was a great time, wasn't it? We got the Beatles, civil rights for African Americans, the counterculture movement, the New Left, the Vietnam War, George Wallace, the assassinations of JFK, MLK, and RFK. Flipper? I mean, who wouldn't want to live in the 60s? 1968, of course, had the addition of being an election year. And there was a lot of fracturing within the Democratic Party and which candidate they should nominate. The field had narrowed down to Minnesota Senator Eugene McCarthy, who was running a progressive anti-war candidacy, South Dakota Senator George McGovern, who entered the race two weeks before the convention to give senators who supported Bobby Kennedy, a candidate that was anti-Eugene McCarthy, and Vice President Hubert Humphrey, who was running pretty much as LBJ's replacement. The younger people who made up the Democratic base were anti-war, so they backed McCarthy, the Democratic establishment backed Hubert Humphrey, and there was a sort of mix of the bunch that tried to shift McGovern. This divide was exemplified in the Democratic National Convention, when a lot of counterculture groups indicated that they would protest the DNC's complacency to the Vietnam War. The biggest of these groups being the Youth International Party, or Yippies as people called them. Other groups in attendance were the National Mobilization Committee to end the war in Vietnam, Women's Strike for Peace, and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. In fact, Yippies decided to choose their own leader to be the Yippie candidate at the convention. Oh no no no, not Abby Hoffman. I meant their true leader, Pegasus. What, you think pigs can't be political leaders? Haven't you read Animal Farm? There were reportedly 10,000 protesters in attendance compared to the 23,000 police and National Guardsmen that were ordered there by Chicago Mayor Richard J. Daley. Daley responded this way in order to show off his accomplishments to the National Democrats in the media, basically saying, look, see, I'm taking charge during all this big hassles. Spoiler alert, it, it did really help him. The protests were held from August 23rd to the 28th, while the convention was held from August 24th to the 29th. In fact, the first instance of violence there was reported when 17-year-old Native American hippie Dean Johnson was stopped by police officers for violating the city curfew. Johnson then pulled out a pistol and misfired, which led to him being shot three times. That only angered protesters even more. There were threats of them throwing nails into the streets, using cars to block important buildings, and even dumping LSD to the local water supply. Though none of these threats ended up actually happening. What did end up happening was them enacting a form of random street theater that didn't really affect the decisions made at the convention, which would attract the attention of the American public and would sort of send a message that Americans didn't really have any control over their political process. Though the protests were peaceful, the police frequently clashed with the protesters, injuring 101 civilians during the week of the convention. The violence wasn't even just outside of the convention. Inside of the convention, CBS correspondent Dan Rather was manhandled by police while trying to interview a Georgia delegate, and writer Terry Southern described the convention hall as, quote, Exactly like approaching a military installation, barbed wire, checkpoints, the whole bit. While other convention goers decried the actions of the police while making their speeches, the protests culminated in the arrest and trial of eight protesters, Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, David Dellinger, Tom Hayden, Renny Davis, John Freunds, Lee Wiener, Bobby Seale, as well as their leader, Pegasus. Though Seale's trial was later severed from the rest, and Pegasus wasn't human, the people tried were called the Chicago Seven. Despite all this, the convention just proceeded as planned. Like I said before, three people were actively seeking the nomination going into the convention. However, three more names ended up making the rounds at the convention. First was an effort to draft Ted Kennedy for the nomination, as none of the three remaining candidates were seen as a 
uniter of the party, whereas Kennedy could sort of be seen as a uniter of all of the factions. But Ted didn't really want to run because he felt that he wasn't ready to take the handle yet. And he was pretty much like, look, I'm just you're just trying to get me to stand in for my brother. And I don't want to build my whole career on being a Kennedy. Ironic. Second was governor of North Carolina, Daniel Moore. While he did not actively seek the nomination, many Southern Democrats really wanted him to be the nominee. Minus the Southern Democrats that were really active in someone's third party bid, but that's not that's not here or there. And the last and more interesting candidate is minister and activist Channing E. Phillips. You see, Phillips was in charge of the D.C. delegation at the convention, which was pledged to vote for Bobby Kennedy. But after Kennedy's assassination, the D.C. delegation decided to have Phillips stand in as a favorite son candidate in an attempt to show, quote, The Negro vote must not be taken for granted. This made Phillips the first African American to have officially stood as a candidate in the presidential election. Inevitably, the delegates were divided up as such. Ted Kennedy got 12.75 delegates, Moore got 17.5 delegates, Phillips got 67.5 delegates, McGovern got 146.5 delegates, McCarthy got 601 delegates, and Humphrey got 1,759.25 delegates. The vice presidential contest was also interesting. Civil rights activist and Georgia State House member Julian Bond initiated a run to sort of stand as an anti-Vietnam War compromise person against Humphrey's chosen running mate, Senator Edmund Muskie, which ultimately led to only 48.5 delegates actually supporting Bond. Now, many people really decried this unfair process as McCarthy won the most primaries Yet he was being denied the nomination, and Humphrey, who did not even actively participate in the primaries, is going to be the nominee. Many people actually tried to pressure McCarthy to run a fourth party bid, you know, mimicking another person who was a former Democrat that was actively leaving to form a new political party, but McCarthy declined to do so, though that didn't stop people from trying to write him in anyways. Though it was after this and their blowout in the general election that compelled DNC chair at the time, Fred Harris, to select George McGovern to create a commission on party structure and delegate selection, also known as the McGovern Fraser Commission, to make the convention process fairer and actually reflect the primary process. The reforms were so big, they literally got delegates to be elected and they had to reflect the primaries. And they even made it so that the primaries had to be held in every state rather than just ones who felt like it. They actually made the Democratic primaries Democratic. The 80s is going to change that, but that's a little bit ahead of ourselves. But I know there's one thing that you have just been having in your mind the entire video. Whatever happened to Yippie Candidate Pegasus? While there was speculation that a police officer ate him, it was reported that Pegasus, as well as a sow and a piglet, were transported to the Anti-Cruelty Society. A happy ending. So yeah, that's the story of the most interesting presidential nomination convention in US history. Though to be fair, some conventions have tried to top it, but not as much. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or join my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. El Pleb es una presentas. Elecciones presidenciales en la historia mexicana. The 19th official presidential election in Mexican history took place on July 1st, 2012. Two days before my 12th birthday. Anyways, Calderon immediately went to work after he was elected. Ten days after he was inaugurated, he officially declared war on the Mexican drug cartels, which made his popularity rise in its early years, but didn't exactly help keep him popular for too long after, as the murder rate skyrocketed during his tenure, with 60,000 deaths directly related to the drug war. Another early problem during his administration was the rise in the price of corn, 
which led to the inflation of tortilla prices. Since the poorest people in Mexico love their tortillas, Calderon had to make the Tortilla Price Stabilization Pact in order to help them. The Great Recession also started to take effect in Mexico, leading to a 4.7 drop in their GDP, but he was able to bounce back. He also made a law that would lower the salaries of all public servants, but would raise the salaries of Mexican police and army. But the most popular policy that he implemented was the creation of Seguro Popular, a universal public health insurance plan that expanded healthcare to 100 million Mexicans. One thing I should also mention is that Calderon was apparently an alcoholic and would occasionally be drunk during appearances not only in Mexico but in foreign places as well. And the Chamber of Duties, despite a massive Voto El Blanco movement to boycott the three major parties, the PRI still ended up being the winner of the night. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the election itself. First, we're going to start off with the New Alliance Party. They had originally wanted to form a coalition with the PRI, even full on announced that they were going to form one. However, they later decided to break off with the PRI due to internal conflicts. While they did have talks with the PAN to form a coalition, they ultimately decided that it was best for them to once again go it solo. Nominating former environmental advisor to President Cedillo, Gabriel Cuadri de la Torre, as their candidate. He ran under the slogan, Do we count on you? The remaining three parties had pretty extensive primary processes to follow. First, we'll start off with the PRD. Two people actively sought the PRD nomination. First was Mexico City Mayor Marcelo Erbard, who would run for president as the candidate of a PRD faction called the New Left. Meanwhile, the heads of the PRD had already made up their mind on wanting to renown and AMLO to be their candidate. Meanwhile, AMLO was like, na 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 bro, we gotta do it the same way we did it last time. So they held an internal party primary poll to see which of the two actually had momentum in the party. Both pledged that they would drop out and endorse whoever wins the internal primary poll in order to have a united front. Meanwhile, Cotemo Cardenas decided to jump into the fray. While not explicitly entering the race, he stated that he'd be open to be the PRD candidate if the polls indicated that he would win and if he didn't have to compete against AMLO and Erbard. The polls had AMLO as the most candidate, so Erbard dropped out and endorsed him. As an olive branch to the Erbrad wing of the party, and will say that if he won the presidency, Erbrad would be a member of the cabinet. Amlo formed a coalition with the Citizens Movement, a rebranded Convergence, and the Labour Party, called the Broad Progressive Front, and ran under the slogan, The Real Change is in Your Hands. Next, we'll talk about the PRI. It was speculated that Mexican Senator Manlio Fabio Beltrones would seek their nomination. In fact, he was seen as a very popular contender for the nomination, but he decided to not seek the party's nomination, paving the way for Governor of Mexico State Enrique Peña Nieto to step up to the plate. He ran uncontested for the nomination and formed a coalition with PVM called The Commitment to Mexico and ran under the slogan, My commitment is with you and with Mexico. And lastly came the PAN, who also decided to go it solo, as they had the most to lose during this election, they needed a good enough candidate to keep the momentum of the last two presidents going. As such, six people stepped up to the plate. First was Governor of Jalisco, Emilio Gonzalez Marquez, Secretary of Education, Alonso Lujambio, and Secretary of Labor, Javier Lozano Alcaron, all of whom dropped out before the primary ended. The ones who stayed in the primary till the end were Santiago Krell, making another run for the presidency, Secretary of Finance and Public Credit, Ernesto Cordeo, and former Chamber of Duties member and cabinet member in the last two administrations, Josefina Vasquez Mota. Vasquez ended up winning the nomination, and she ran under the slogan, The Woman Has a Word. There was talk of former Chamber of Duties member and son of former PAN presidential candidate, Manuel Cracero Carrillo, running as an independent, but as stated in the previous video, that was not allowed. The biggest issues of the campaign were the drug war and corruption. As such, 
each candidate had to emphasize their various plans to tackle these issues. Peña Nieto promised to reduce the amount of violence brought on by the drug war while reassuring that he would still be aggressive to the cartels. Bit of a mixed bag in issues. Vasquez promised that life sentences to any politicians found guilty of corruption related to organized crime, whereas Amlo and Cradri took more maverick positions on the issues. Quadri openly stated that he would be in favor of decriminalizing drugs, whereas AMLO proposed a plan entitled Hugs Not Bullets, which would not only call for the decriminalization of drugs, but also would try to stop the violence within Mexico and focus on tackling the root of the problem via social programs. Quadri decided to be even more of a maverick and be the only candidate in this election to openly call for the legalization of same-sex marriage. But the one candidate that everybody seemed to have a very controversial viewpoint of, no matter who you asked, was Peña Nieto. Some saw him as a young, charismatic glimmer of hope, while others saw him as same old, same old PRI, but with a more appealing paint job. Not helped by the fact that during a campaign appearance at a university, he was asked a question about an incident during his gubernatorial tenure where he ordered state police to quell protests, which ended up with protesters being beaten, raped, and murdered by the police. And Nieto responded saying, Look, the Supreme Court said it's okay, so I'm all good here. And when the students protested Peña Nieto's response, the media said, No, 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 no you don't understand. You see, th these protests, they weren't actually like protests of the students, these are just paid off actors by leftist groups. The, st the students actually really liked Peña Nieto. And 131 of the students responded to this by posting a video of them showing their student IDs and openly stating, we were there at the protest, we don't like Nieto, which led to a huge movement across Mexico called Yo Soy 132, where students all across Mexico define themselves as the 132nd student. This movement evolved to not only being a mass protest movement against Peña Nieto, but also the alleged media bias in his favor and called for the process to be more democratic and open, especially with the presidential debates. The first of which wasn't nationally syndicated, Nieto was seen by many in the media as the victor of the debate, though the debate did change one aspect. Originally, people considered Vasquez to be Nieto's prime opposition, but AMLO's better performance in the debate solidified him as the major antithesis to Nieto. The Yo Soy 132 movement's calls for an open debate was heated as the second debate was nationally televised, albeit on news networks like Televisia and TV Azteca, networks that were seen as pro-Nieto. They even managed to get a third debate held, but it was held online, a thing that the average Mexican household did not really have at the time. So the Yo Soy 132 movement didn't necessarily see this as an accomplishment. By the media standards, the race was pretty much a done deal for Nieto, as he was pulling double digits ahead of all of his opponents. It was so much of a done deal, Vincente Fox ended up endorsing Nieto over the PAN's candidate. But, right before the election, a bombshell hit. Remember when the Yo Soy 132 movement accused the media of playing favoritism towards Peña Nieto? Well, The Guardian published a series of articles showing that their accusations were 100% true and that Televisia was actually selling positive coverage to Peña Nieto and was explicitly plotting against AMLO throughout the entirety of the campaign. It was even discovered that many of the supporters for Nieto was indeed manufactured, especially by the use of bots on social media called the Peña Bots. Though the revelation may have come way too late. And here are the results. Peña Nieto won with 38.2% of the vote. AMLO got a close second with 31.6% of the vote. Vasquez got 23.39% of the vote. And Quadri received 2.28% of the vote. And in the Chamber of Duties, the Commitment of Mexico got 241 seats, the Broad Progressive Fund got 135 seats, 
the PAN got 114 seats, and the New Alliance Party got 10 seats. AMLO once again contested the election results due to the prior accusations, plus accusations that the PRI had bought votes of many people on election day by using prepaid bank cards and pre-marked ballots. AMLO demanded a full recount and even said that he wanted this election invalidated. Protests broke out, but the most that they got was another partial recount of the election. So things eventually moved on. However, by November of that year, AMLO had announced that rather than trying to get the Yo Soy 132 movement to join up with the PRD, he would instead form a new political party in order to try and translate this momentum into political action. Will this party end up doing anything of value? Well, te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when the future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quarter, join my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. We all know about the U.S. presidential debates, right? The two major presidential candidates meet up with each other and talk about the issues for like an hour or two with the idea of getting undecided voters due to their performance. But wouldn't campaigning suffice in this? I mean, why did this idea of getting these two candidates coming together to talk about the issues come from? Well, it traces its roots all the way back to 1858 during the Illinois Senate race between incumbent Senator Stephen Douglas and challenger Abraham Lincoln. Douglas and Lincoln decided to hold seven debates over the course of the election, though not in the way that we hold debates now. For starters, there was no moderator and certainly no commercials. The debates were organized like this. Candidate 1 would talk for 60 uninterrupted minutes, then candidate 2 would talk for 90 uninterrupted minutes, both rebutting candidate 1 and also bringing his own platform to light, then candidate 1 would give a 30 minute rebuttal, then they'd shake hands and go their separate ways. Now I know some of you particulars in the comments will be saying, this was a senate debate not a presidential debate, well yes, but due to the fact that this is pretty much something that never happened before, this was wildly circulated around Illinois and then ended up making its way to academic circles all across the country. And then when these two ended up becoming their party's nominees for president two years later, these debates were used as ways to promote their candidacies. Bell, Breckenridge, and Smith <laughs> were left in the dust. Now you might think that this may give some people ideas, but it was a long while before we even got talk of any other legitimate presidential debate. It didn't end up popping up in people's heads until the advent of radio, getting a similar precursor with a debate between Norman Thomas and Huey Long in 1934, then in 1940, Wendell Wilkie officially challenged FDR to the first presidential debate. FDR declined the offer, so it's gonna take a little while before someone actually does take people up on their offers. It didn't take that long, to be honest. Only eight years, because in 1948, there was a radio debate held between Republican presidential candidates Thomas Dewey and Harold Stassen that was broadcast out of Oregon. The Democrats won up them, in 1956 when they hosted the first televised presidential debate between Democrat primary candidates Adlai Stevenson and S.S. Kiefer. But later that year, University of Maryland student Fred Kahn led an ambitious plan. Get Adlai Stevenson and Dwight D. Eisenhower to be part of a televised general election debate, sending multiple letters to newspaper organizations to garner interest in the event and even sending one to Eleanor Roosevelt, who ended up forwarding the letter to Stevenson's campaign manager. The debate was this close to happening, but it ended up not happening. At least, not in the way you think. You see, while Stevenson and Eisenhower never debated, two days before the election, they invited Eleanor Roosevelt and Margaret Chase Smith to debate on behalf of the candidates, 
though don't count Khan out of the woods yet. You see, the efforts for this presidential debate that he wanted were published nationwide and made many media organizations go, hmm, you know, this doesn't sound like that bad of an idea. And after the 1960 primary gave us a debate between Hubert Humphrey and JFK, CBS officially held a general election presidential debate between JFK and Richard Nixon. It changed politics for quite a number of reasons, because as opposed to a primary debate, where it's the wings of the party who usually pay extra attention to the issues, being the only people who are actually watching, now we have the fabled undecideds watching, so policy isn't really the only thing a politician needs to focus on in the debate. And not even just how good did they sound when they were espousing their views like in radio debates, it now added appearance and charisma to the mix. And while Nixon was seen as more of an experienced person on policy and a great radio debater, Kennedy was more equipped to the standards of TV debates, and it gave him a huge advantage. So Kennedy was seen as the victor of the debate, and, as you can see, emerged overall victorious in the election. You'd think that this would make general election debates a mainstay, but no, <laughs> they were not. We didn't get another general election debate until the 1976 election between Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford. This time, it was sponsored by the advocacy group League of Women Voters, and it showed that everybody was out of practice, because at one point, there was an audio glitch that caused the mics of the two candidates to be muted without their knowledge, and forcing them to just stand there in silence for 27 minutes. Then when they got back on, they were like, okay, so uh, closing statements, please. And much like 1960, the debates could actually make or break a person's candidacy. You see, Ford was seen as the winner of the first debate, but an incorrect statement about the Eastern Bloc in debate two was seen as the biggest factor in tanking Ford's candidacy. The 1980 presidential election brought upon a first for the presidential debates, as rather than just inviting the two major party candidates, they also invited independent candidate John B. Anderson to participate in the debates, as they thought he was notable enough to make a sting in the election. Though it led to a very weird scenario, as incumbent President Jimmy Carter declined to debate if Anderson was included, which sucks, but hey, they could just uninvite Anderson. However, challenger Ronald Reagan declined to debate if Anderson was excluded. So that led to the first debate to exclude Jimmy, the second debate to exclude everybody, and the third one to exclude John. John's exclusion led to his poll numbers to drop and hanging his candidacy. We didn't get another major change in the debate structure until 1988, when the campaigns of George Bush and Michael Dukakis made some agreements that decided who could participate in the debates, who could be the panelists, and even the height of the podiums used in the debates, which caused the League of Women Voters to withdraw their support for the presidential debates, as they felt that this was hugely unfair. Which just paved the way for the two major parties to make the Commission on Presidential Debates, the new sponsor of the debates, a private company owned by the two major parties, which was pretty much just a way to curb third parties entering the debates. That was until 1992 when Ross Perot's momentum was so big that he forced the CPD to let him in. Though they pretty much just taught them they need to put an official threshold on the books, which led to the first of many legal challenges of the CPD. And it wasn't until 2000 when it was officially written on paper that the minor parties needed 15% in five national polls to get into the debate, which angered many minor party advocates because they see this as a really exclusionary task. Because, think about it, being in the debates is pretty much what makes people rise and fall in the polls, and most pollsters and pundits do not include minor party candidates in their reporting unless they get into the debates or are seen as notable enough to be worthy, but if they're not worthy enough to be in the debates, then how can they rise in the polls? They can't rise in the polls without the media coverage, and they won't give them the coverage unless they get notable enough in the polls, so how are they going to get in the debates or anything? The answer is, they don't. 
So yeah, that's just a little bit of the history and rundown of the presidential debates. Will the new ones be entertaining? Well, they usually are. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when a future video comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, join my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. Que plebes unam presentas Elecciones presidenciales en la historia mexicana The 20th official presidential election in Mexican history took place on July 1st, 2018. Remember in the last election when people were divided over if Peña Nieto was a glimmer of hope for Mexico? Or same old, same old PRI? Yeah, guess who ended up being right during all that? Nieto's administration was... Mixed at best. We'll start off with the positives. Under his administration, more than 2 million jobs were created, more than half of which were actually well paying. He also created special economic zones in the southern slash poorer parts of the country to expand industries. That's pretty much all I can say about the positives of Nieto. He continued the Mexican drug war, censored and spied out journalists that spoke out against him, such as Carmen Arstuegui, who exposed the house that Nieto owned, was actually registered in the name of a company he had contracted to build a bullet train. The biggest policy he enacted during his administration was the partial privatization of Mexican's oil industry, which had nothing to do with the fact that the head of a Brazilian oil company was funding Nieto's campaign before being appointed as the head of Pemex. The privatization led to gas prices going up and massive protests against Nieto. And remember the media bias from the last election? Well, it was still prevalent as Time Magazine published an article entitled Saving Mexico, where they claimed that Nieto was ending the drug war and the privatization of oil was loved by the Mexican populace. Yeah, um, most of the time people don't protest things they like. But the biggest event that happened during his administration was when on September 26, 2014, 43 students who were traveling via bus to commemorate the Tlatelolco massacre disappeared. And it was later discovered that Mexican police had kidnapped the students and given them up to a cartel to be massacred. It wasn't even just local cops either. Federal police and the military allegedly took part in this as well. Yeah, unsurprisingly, Nieto's approval rating dropped as low as 12% by the end of his term, and Mexican people were saying this. Nieto's approval going down meant that the approval of opposition parties went up. But the same old, same old opposition parties weren't necessarily cutting it for Mexico, so two more parties were actually born to oppose Nieto. First, we'll talk about the Social Encounter Party, a Christian conservative right-wing populist political party. But the more prevalent one was the one that I teased in the last video, the one that AMLO founded. The party was called Movimiento Regeneración Nacional, or the National Regeneration Movement, or Morena because AMLO really liked nicknames, Morena sought to translate the Yo Soy One Three Two movement into political action and hearken to the ideology of the Cardenases. Morena was the more popular of the two, winning more seats than three long-existing political parties in Mexico. With all that out of the way, let's move on to the presidential election itself. Nine parties were eligible to participate in this election, but in 1994, this is not. So, only three of them actually ended up running camp. First, we'll start off with the PRI. They had the presidency, but their grip on power was hanging by a thread. So, they needed a candidate with broad enough appeal to keep the power. First, they reformed their electoral process to give non-party members the ability to seek their party's nomination. A lot of people tried to push themselves as their candidate. However, the party officially decided to wipe off the old Dedazo strategy and nominated cabinet member to Calderon and Nieto, Jose Antonio Maid, to be their candidate. Second was the PAN, which had a similar situation. A lot of people tried to seek the party's nomination, 
but the party was really only interested in two people's prospects. Former First Lady to Felipe Calderon, Margarita Zavala, and former party president, Ricardo Anaya. As much as Zavala tried, it seemed that they didn't want her association with Calderon to hinder them, and they pretty much decided to nominate Anaya. Zavala and her supporters criticized this as pretty much being the Didazo in disguise, and not that long after, Zavala decided to resign from the PAN. And lastly, was the leftist party of Morena. Yeah, newly formed Morena decided to step into the plate and offer up a candidate for the election, as opposed to the already existing left-wing parties. The reason the PRD didn't step up to the plate was that right before the midterms, Contemo Carnas decided to leave the PRD, and they were going through a bit of an identity crisis without their moral leader, an identity crisis they are still going through to this day. But back to Morena, there was absolutely zero hesitation in nominating Amwell as their candidate despite his past failures. Now, where does that leave the remaining political parties? Well, they could have ran their own candidates, and many of them thought about running their own candidates, but they all felt that it was probably in their best interest to form alliances with one of the three major candidates in order to have a good chance to have a platform being heard. First, we'll start off with the Labour Party, which was also pretty unanimous in deciding that AMLO would be their nominee. In fact, this made many people think that the PRD and the Citizens Movement would join up with Morena and the Labour Party to form a broad leftist coalition. However, AMLO himself personally stated that this was not going to happen due to the differences that these parties had that caused AMLO to leave and form his own run to begin with. Especially considering during the midterms, these two parties actually ran candidates against Morena, whereas the Labour Party, being concerned with leftism being the broad idea of Mexico, chose to stand down and align itself with Morena during the midterms. So where does that leave these two? Well, they were born out of PRI dissidents, so that was off that table 100%. So they decided to join in a coalition with Ricardo Anaya, called the Front for Mexico in order to combat the PRI, but also stand a chance against AMLO. They ran under the motto, Facing the Future, President Anaya. Next was the ecologist Green Party of Mexico. Now you see, they originally wanted to join the Front for Mexico, but party differences had decided that that was not going to happen. They briefly considered running their own candidates, even at one point floating the idea of stealing the PRD's moral leader, Cardenas, but they inevitably decided, eh, we'll just join a coalition with the PRI. The New Alliance Party had similar intentions. They considered having Quadri run as their candidate again, but they felt that maybe joining the Front for Mexico was a better use for their time. However, negotiations fell through again, so they decided to hold their noses and joined a coalition with the PRI and PFAM. The coalition was aptly titled Citizen Made for Mexico. But the Electoral Commission said, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on a second, bro. You can't have your candidate's name and your alliance name. You'd be turning all the down ballot races to campaign memorabilia for you, so you gotta do you gotta change that. So they renamed their coalition to Everyone for Mexico and ran under the motto Move Forward with You. And lastly came the Social Encounter Party. They didn't exactly know what to do. First, there were talks of them running Zavala as their candidate, but plans fell through. Now you might say, how about the Front for Mexico? Mexico had already been controlled by the PAN for 12 years, and things didn't get better, so... They were hesitant on doing that. And the party leader, Hugo Flores, already blatantly stated, we do not negotiate with the PRI. And soon after also stated, We have two options. Go alone or go with Morena. And soon afterwards, they decided to join up with Morena's coalition and they called it Together We Will Make History, running under the motto, uh, Together We Will Make History. This decision was criticized by the media as PES was very different ideologically from the remaining members of the coalition, but AMLO responded by saying, the party believes in inclusion 
And Hugo Flores responded by saying, The only possibility of real change in a country is one headed by Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador. So it comes off more ideologically pure than the previous coalitions. Was that it? No, because this was the first election in a long time where independent presidential candidates could participate in, and as such, many independents decided to join in the fray. First was former senator from Guero, Armando Rios Petir, who had left the PRD to start an independent political movement called the Jaguar Movement. Second was Maria de Jesus Patricio Martinez, who would run as the candidate of the National Indigenous Congress and the Zapatistas. Third was former governor of Nuevo León, Jaime El Bronco Calderón, who had been notable for calling out the media's unfair coverage of his gubernatorial run. He ran under the motto, Not allowed to give up. And lastly was Margarita Salava, running a campaign that would call out the party she had previously been aligned with, running under the motto, Courage is Margarita. However, of these four, Savala was the only one to turn in enough signatures to appear on the ballot. Petir thought that this was good, and he proposed him and Calderon unite behind Zavala to have a unified independent front to rehabilitate all of the major parties in Mexico. But Calderon decided to appeal to the Elections Commission, and he was allowed to appear on the ballot. No such luck for the other two. Now this election was a huge boiling point as it came after 78 uninterrupted years of neoliberalism and neoconservatism, Mexico was sick and tired of the same old, same old, and they wanted change. All of the candidates tried to position themselves as the candidate of change in a variety of ways. Anaya promised to implement a universal basic income, and while Zalala proposed ending all benefits presidents got after their term ends, though Amo specified that he would then use that money to help senior citizens, Maid promised to create a government agency called the Unique Registry of the Necessities of Each Person to keep track of the individual needs of every Mexican citizen, an idea that was mocked relentlessly. Plus, Maid was openly trying to continue Nieto's privatization of the oil industry, which Amlo criticized, and El Bronco proposed bringing back the death penalty for high crimes such as murder and drug trafficking and cutting off the hands of government officials accused of corruption. But the one thing that seemed to be on everybody's mind was what would happen to Nieto? As he was accused of corruption too, what's gonna happen to him? Anaya stated that he would be open to an investigation towards Nieto, but Amlo stated that he would also extend that honor towards every past president still alive. You see, the common thing that was established during the selection cycle was that whatever one of the other candidates offered, AMLO usually provided a better version of it. One candidate wants to keep privatizing the oil industry, AMLO wants to renationalize it. One candidate wants to punish the most recent president for his corruption, AMLO wants to try and extend that to all the past presidents. One candidate wants to just stop having the president receiving many of these big kinds of benefits, AMLO wants to do that too but also wants to use that money to help senior citizens and doesn't have the baggage of having previously gotten those benefits as the first lady. One candidate wants to stop corruption by cutting off corrupt officials' hands off. AMLO will try to stop corruption in a more peaceful manner? You see, the basic takeaway was that Mexico was sick and tired of the same old, same old PRI, the PAN with a slightly different flavor, and people who were supposedly dissidents who left these two parties weren't exactly giving them what they wanted either. So then that leaves AMLO as the final person that they have as a person to offer ideas. And the ideas he offered, they were really supportive of it. And AMLO quickly shot to the top of the polls, having pretty much double-digit leads throughout the entire election. The closest anyone ever got in the polls was Anaya being below AMLO by 8 points. Things were looking good for AMLO, even more so when Zalava suspended her campaign, leaving just the three amigos opposing AMLO. However, there was a bit of trouble on the horizon for him. Coming from the good old US of A. First, US Secretary of Homeland Security at the time, John Kelly, stated that a leftist president, quote, 
would not be good for America or Mexico. And U.S. National Secretary Advisor at the time, H.R. McMaster, claimed that Russia was going to influence the Mexican presidential election. Now, he didn't say who Russia was going to influence in the Mexican presidential election, but the implication was there. Even more so when PRI President Enrique Ochoa Arenza openly stated that AMLO was being supported by, quote, Russian and Venezuelan interests. U.S. Senators Bob Menendez and Marco Rubio also called Rex Tillerson to investigate Russian meddling in Mexican elections. Bit interesting coming from little Marco. AMLO, of course, denied all these allegations, even mocking them by referring to himself as Andreas Manuelovich, and paid really no mind to this and focused more on actually campaigning for the presidency. The more legitimate concerns of election tampering came from the PRI, as it turns out, they were up to their old shenanigans from previous years, accusations that they'd vote by or crash the system again, and apparently made have his own army of bots. In fact, it was reported that 94% of his Twitter followers were bots. Plus, Maeve spent more money during the campaign than Amlo and Anaya combined, and yet, when asked, he would never tell anybody where he got the money from. In comparison, Amlo was apparently the best in reporting his finances. And here are the results. Unsurprisingly, but not for the reason that we're used to, Amlo won, getting 53.19% of the popular vote. Anaya got 22.28% of the popular vote. Maid got 16.41% of the popular vote. El Bronco got 5.23% of the vote. And despite her dropping out, 0.06% of people still voted for Zalava. In the Chamber of Duties, Amlo's coalition easily won a majority in a huge electoral landslide. Though there were some party shifts that did happen not that long after Election Day, and even more so, changing now. For starters, the New Alliance Party and the Social Encounter Party received the least amount of votes among the remaining parties and lost their registries, dissolving and merging into the coalitions that they were already a part of. Second, the PRD, still going through their identity crisis, announced that they would leave the PAN's coalition and try to figure things out on their own. Third, PVEM announced that they would leave the PRI's coalition and join up with Morena and the Labour Party to form a new coalition. And lastly, Felipe Calderon and his wife Zalala announced that they were going to be forming their own political party called Mexico Libre that would be contesting in the 2021 midterms. Speaking of the 2021 midterms, Amla himself had actually stated that due to his populist leanings, he would be open to the idea of holding a mid-election vote on his presidency so that the people, if they didn't like him, could choose to kick him out of the presidency early. So maybe I might be seeing you a little sooner than I thought. Oh yeah, and uh, these smears that he faced during this election and his life up to this point, yeah, they haven't gone away either. <laughs> so, either next year or in 2023, te veré para las próximas elecciones, amigo. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, join me on Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. The spoiler effect is best defined like this. There are three candidates, candidate A, candidate B, and candidate C. Candidates A and B are major party candidates who are radically different either in ideology or in voting base. Candidate C is a minor party candidate who espouses similar views to candidate A, so voters who would normally vote for candidate A, who are more purist or are just not fans of candidate A, are inclined to vote for candidate C, thus splitting the vote and allowing candidate B a possible win. The most commonly cited examples of the spoiler effect being used in U.S. elections are in 1912, when Teddy Roosevelt supposedly spoiled the election for Woodrow Wilson, and the 2000 election, where Ralph Nader supposedly spoiled the election for George W. Bush. However, third-party advocates say that the spoiler effect 
either just flat out doesn't exist or is inappropriately used to target third party candidates as a way to sort of quell opposition to the two major parties, Ralph Nader being best quoted as saying, Al Gore thinks we're supposed to be helping him get elected. I've got news for Al Gore. If he can't beat the bumbling Texas governor with that terrible record, he ought to go back to Tennessee. Now, personally, I happen to be in the group that is more skeptical of the spoiler effect, even personally dumbing it the spoiler myth. And let me just give a couple of reasons why I sort of came to that conclusion. First, I guess I should address one point. Isn't that just kind of how elections work? Aren't you supposed to all be trying to get voters? And whoever gets the most voters wins? Like, hypothetically, wouldn't a Republican really want a bunch of Democrats to be voting for him in a certain state that could lead to him winning? But some say, well, I mean, sure, but that's not necessarily a good thing because minor party candidates, they don't have a chance of winning, so they really shouldn't be trying to steal votes from another major party candidate. However, you should also note that then by that notion, shouldn't Republicans stop trying to campaign in states like New York or California? I mean, they'd, they'd be absolutely thrilled to have Democrats vote for them in those states. It could lead to them winning, maybe. Though to be fair, that's more of a semi-point. A more legitimate point comes from the fact that most of the time the spoiler effect kind of ignores actual facts of certain voters. What do I mean by that? Well, of course, there's the loaded assumption that a person who voted for candidate C would have automatically voted for candidate A if they had not been in the race. Again, that's a pretty loaded assumption. People make their own decisions of their own volition. Sometimes it's voting for a third-party candidate. Sometimes it means not voting at all. Like, for example, how can we know that every single Ralph Nader voter would have voted for Al Gore if Nader wasn't even in the race? The assumption purely comes from the notion that Al Gore and Ralph Nader had huge similarities when in fact during the election Nader was explicitly running on the things that he and Gore differed on. In fact, in the big state that everybody complained about, Florida, he didn't even attract a certain number of Democrats. He only attracted 24,000 Democrats, whereas 308,000 Democrats voted for George Bush in the state. Plus, Florida had a huge other set of factors in play like SCOTUS canceling the proposed recount and such. Mr. Beat's video probably explains it better. Another similar situation comes from the 2018 Ohio District 12 special election. After the Democrat lost a very narrow race, the Green Party candidate was blamed, as well as Russia, despite the fact that even if all of the Green Party voters voted for the Democrat, it would have still led to a Republican victory. Another commonly cited supposed spoiler is Ross Perot, with people just in this day and age half-heartedly just saying, oh yeah, Ross Perot's definitely spoiled the election for George Bush, when they have zero evidence to back up that claim. Many people try to cite his supposed conservative beliefs, because as we all know, a pro-choice protectionist tax-raising populist really screams conservative. And if you want to look at the data, you'd see that only 27% of pros voters identified as conservatives. The remaining percentage makes up liberals and independents, and independents are usually seen as democratic leaning. Another piece of data people don't really to look into is the non-voter factor. As I stated before, voters can choose not to vote at all if the candidates provided to them are not satisfactory, and rather blaming the certain number of voters who happen to vote for a minor party candidate, you should focus on the larger people who don't vote at all factor. In the 2016 election, only 55.67% of registered voters bothered to vote at all. That leaves a decent amount of the population that wasn't satisfied with any of the candidates on their ballot. But who do you think got the most media coverage? The 44.33% of people who didn't bother to vote? Or the 4.35% that voted for Gary Johnson or Jill Stein. It really comes off more as a scapegoat rather than actually being a problem that needs to be fixed. Because if it was a problem that needed to be fixed, 
they could fix it in a snap. What do I mean by that? Let's put you in the shoes of whatever major party you prefer. You see that there is a minor party that could potentially be hurting your electoral chances in a state or in a district. You could try suppressing that party, which the major parties have been known to do from time to time, but that would just alienate those voters even more so from you and would make your political rivals rise in popularity for standing up for them. Here's another solution. You could institute a voting system that would make it so that those voters of that smaller party who's like-minded to you will inevitably be voting for you via instant runoff voting, better known as rank choice voting, where they would rank the candidates based on how much they want the candidate to win. Their first choice would be their, of course, ideal candidate, whereas their second or third choice might be simply to prevent their least like candidate from winning the office. Hypothetically, in this election, people who would be more inclined to vote for the Green Party candidate due to their ideological pureness to their lefty ideas would then vote for Biden as their second choice to be strictly anti-Trump. The issue is, every time ranked choice voting gets introduced in the House of Representatives, it gets co-sponsors in the single digits. And sometimes when it is passed, major parties try to undermine it or get rid of it. Maine became the first state to implement and use ranked choice voting, but every step of the way, it was undermined and almost not implemented at all. If the two major parties truly believed that this was a problem that needed to be fixed, why would they not fix it? Well, I mean, unless they just needed a scapegoat. But why would anybody need a scapegoat in politics? And lastly, if the spoiler effect is truly just a thing in politics that is just there, should it be 100% proven and 100% foolproof? What if I told you that there was an election that was specifically tailored for the spoiler effect to happen? Specifically tailored. All the factors for the spoiler effect were there. Candidates splitting off from one of the two major parties and forming their own parties, stealing a sizable amount of their bases, and running very serious, very big campaigns. And yet, despite this, the party they left remained victorious. Well, let's go back to 1948. Harry Truman was angering two prominent factions within the Democratic Party, New Deal Progressive Democrats and Southern Conservative Democrats. Both factions tried to primary him with Richard Russell Jr. representing the Southern Democrats and Claude Pepper representing the New Deal Democrats. Then, after they lost, Strom Thurmond and Henry Wallace left the party to form two of their own parties and took these two democratic bases with them. And these weren't like small bases, these were huge bases within the parties. One of their bases was seen as the thing keeping the democratic party alive in the south. People thought if democrats lost the south, it was over and they would never be able to win again. Under the rules of the spoiler effect, you'd think bye bye Harry. And many people at the time thought that too. However, if you know anything about politics, you know the story and you know how it ends. And this isn't like Ralph Nader or Jill Stein who could have supposedly taken some like-minded voters away from them. No, these are people who literally took members of their party with them when they left, taking sizable amounts of their base with them to support their candidacies, and yet Truman still walked out victorious. That's honestly one of the biggest nails in the coffin of the spoiler myth, when you have the perfect election for it, just not providing the evidence you need. Now of course, I'll be fair, I'll be legitimately fair and acknowledge that I am not 100% on this, I'm 100% on the examples I provided, but on its bearing on the entire spoiler myth slash effect, mm, I'm gonna say 80-70% sure that it's just complete no-no. 
But of course you may have to look at it more on a case by case basis. And this video is just more me presenting my case as there are a lot of people who present their case with a spoiler effect and I feel that maybe I should present my case countering them. I just feel that maybe we shouldn't just flat out dismiss all third party candidates as wasted votes in spawning the election without at least having a reasonable case from the other side. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, join my Discord, or check out my articles on the independent political report. Before we get into the main topic of this video, maybe it would be best for me to explain what a recall election is for those who don't live in states that allow recalls. A recall is where a group of people in a state who have problems with a certain elected official circulate a petition to get a motion on their ballot to remove an elected official from office before the next election is scheduled to happen, while simultaneously holding an election to elect the replacement for that official. It was one of the many reforms brought up during the Progressive Era, as it was seen as a way to be more democratic, because now when there's an elected official who is incredibly crappy at their job, the people of the state don't have to be like, well, we gotta wait like four more years before we can remove them. They can just go, oh no wait, let's remove him now. It's currently not on the federal level, only statewide. So the highest ranking officials that have been recalled have been governors. And even then, it's really only happened twice. Despite the many attempts to try and do it more than twice. Now I know there's one particular gubernatorial recall that everybody remembers. But that video is scheduled for two weeks from now. Because I felt it was best to go over the first successful gubernatorial recall before tackling that one. First, let's set the scene because it might be weird without some context. In the 1910s to 1920s, North Dakota was pretty much dominated by the Republican Party, with the Republican primary pretty much deciding who would win statewide offices, which led to the GOP having two factions fight for control of the GOP. First was the Nonpartisan League, a group founded by former Socialist Party organizer Arthur C. Townley to bring about the interests of small farmers and merchants. The other being the Independent Voters Association, a conservative capitalist alternative to the NPL. The NPL was in charge at the time by helping elect Lynn Frazier to three two-year terms. His tenure was seen as a success by implementing many reforms like the Bank of North Dakota and the North Dakota Mill and Elevator. However, the IVA took issue with the NPL government taking control of both of those endeavors and began a private business-led grassroots movement, much like the Tea Party, to try and get Frazier, as well as Attorney General William Lemke and Commissioner of Agriculture John Hagan, all of whom acted as board members for state-owned entities, recall. Their petitions weren't really popular at first, because people were doing alright in North Dakota, but then an economic depression hit the agricultural sector hard. Now, all economic problems are usually blamed on the current administration, so the IVA was able to ramp up signature getting and was able to get 73,000 signatures by September, which was enough to get a recall election done on October 28th, 1921. Frazier ran for the runoff as the NPL candidate, and the IVA ran former state representative Ragnivald Nestos as their candidate. And, shock of all shocks, considering the title of the video, Nestos won with 50.94% of the vote, with Frazier getting a close second with 49.06% of the vote. Lemk and Hagen were also recalled from their offices. Now, Nestos's tenure was interesting, as he didn't stop these two state-run offices. He actually sought to improve them and make them successes, but I'm not going to get into that because I don't really care, because this video is supposed to be about the recall election. I should probably let you guys know what happened to the three recalled politicians. Well, ironically, Hagen was able to get his job back in 1937, Frazier was able to be elected to the Senate seat in the following election, and Lemke, well, we all know what happened with Lemke. Yeah, but I know what you're all thinking, really. I don't care about North Dakota. I want to talk about the other gubernatorial recall, to which I have to respond with 
then why the heck did you click on the video? But yeah, I'm going to talk about that one in two weeks. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website or follow my Facebook, Twitter, or Quora, join my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. Now that we know about the first effective gubernatorial recall, let's talk about the more well-known recall election. First, again, let's give some context. The year is 2002, and the incumbent Democratic governor of California, Gray Davis, was just elected for a second term, but he was obviously declining in popularity. You see, his first term began with the dot-com bubble, which made his poll numbers go up, but ended with the California electricity crisis. For those who don't know what that is, it was when electric companies manipulated the market to cause an artificial shortage of electricity in California, causing many statewide blackouts. Pretty much everybody blamed Davis as they felt that he didn't do jack to help Californians during the crisis, pointing out many of Davis's recent re-election contributions from these same energy companies left him with his hands tied. Speaking of campaign contributions, People also caught on the fact that Davis received donations from the California Correctional Peace Officers Association and later helped pass a bill that would give this group a $5 billion raise, so he f of course faced some bribery accusations. The recall began when activist Ted Costa, GOP consultant Mark Abernathy, and state representative Howard Kalugian started to gathering signatures. Though nobody really cared about these efforts until... Representative at the time, Daryl Issa, donated $2 million to the campaign, as well as announcing that should a recall happen, he will run himself as a candidate to replace Davis. The petition ended up getting 1.6 million signatures. This recall effort was to be organized by Lieutenant Governor Cruz Bustamante. It's usually the governor's job to handle recalls, but since he was the one being recalled, they couldn't really ask him to be in charge of it, because that'd be a huge conflict of interest. The recall ballot was structured like this. There were two sections of the ballot that you had to bottle in. One, should Governor Davis be recalled? And two, which of the candidates listed below do you want to replace him? If a majority of people voted no on question one, question two would be made irrelevant, and Davis would remain in power. But if a majority voted no... Well, then one of these candidates would replace him. As such, this was different than most other gubernatorial recalls, and Davis would not actually be a candidate in the election, and he would purely be advocating for people to vote for the no option. He cited the recall was an insult to people who participated in the 2002 election, and was a waste of taxpayer money, and he pointed out a potential scenario where yes wins by a majority of votes in question one, but the votes for the no option would be larger than the votes for the highest polling candidate of the recall, which would mean a smaller amount of the population actually gets to choose who the governor is. And, due to the fact that this was so close to the last election, they decided they were going to skip the primary process and instead have every candidate filing actually make it onto the general election ballot, which made Davis decry the fact that someone who could be elected the next governor would be from the far right or the far left. And since this was a Republican-led effort, he focused on the right-wing power grab aspect of all this. And due to the fact that they had to organize this whole election process very fast, they significantly lowered the candidate requirements to ensure that somebody could be chosen on the ballot come election day. A California Democrat or Republican just needed 65 signatures from their respective parties and pay $35,000, or get 10,000 signatures with no payment required, minor parties were given a break and only had to get 150 signatures from their respective party, no money required. Now, I know what you're all sitting there thinking about. Yeah, 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 we, we've heard enough about the process. What about the candidates that actually ran in this election? Well, here we go. Now, before we continue, we're going to have to establish big ground rules for who I talk about because 135 candidates managed to get on the recall ballot. And due to the lower requirements to get on the ballot, many of them were just average Joes or celebrities building up their profiles, like Hustler Magazine publisher Larry Flint, adult film actress Mary Carey, 
and Gary Coleman running as candidates. And as much as the remaining 128 candidates tried to make themselves a factor in this race, it really only ended up being a race between five candidates. First, what the heck were the Democrats going to do? Were they going to campaign purely against the recall? Would they campaign for someone in the recall? And if so, who? The California Democratic Party, at the behest of Davis, urged prominent Democrats to mostly sit out of the recall in order to delegitimize its efforts. But of course, it was best for them to have at least one can on the ballot. You know, just in case it actually works. The most prominent candidate that the Democrats actually tried to run was Senator Dianne Feinstein, as she was the most popular statewide Democrat, but she declined to do so. Insurance Commissioner John Garamundi briefly entered the race, but dropped out two days later. The candidate who eventually became the Democrats' torchbearer was Lieutenant Governor Cruz Bustamante, who had an icy relationship with Davis throughout the tenure. His decision to run was very controversial, as it kind of made people question Davis and his administration. In fact, considering the fact that Cruz was running against Davis, many people assumed that he was a Republican. That's how strange many people saw this decision. However, he did run on a slogan called No to Recall, Yes on Bustamante, which showed he did ultimately oppose the recall election and was running pretty much just to be the safeguard in case it actually works. Now, Cruz and Davis were more moderate Democrats, so the left wasn't really too keen on them. Let's see who these guys have to offer. There were two major left-wing candidates that they were trying to rally behind. First was independent candidate and author Ariana Huffington, whose biggest policy position was public financing of elections. The other being the 2002 Green Party gubernatorial candidate and 1976 Socialist Workers Party presidential candidate, Peter Camejo, who was running as the officially endorsed Green Party candidate, although there were a couple tiny Greens that entered. These two had actually made joint campaign appearances together to push for left-wing issues in the race. Now onto the GOP, the organizers of this whole thing. First was State Representative Tom McClintock announcing he would run, but his campaign was completely overshadowed by the fact that Issa already stated he wanted to run. However, both of them took a back seat when film actor Arnold Schwarzenegger announced his candidacy on The Jay Leno Show. After that, Issa immediately dropped out of the race and endorsed him, but McClintock stayed in the race. The reason being, I assume because McClintock thought like many of the other celebrities who were entering in this race, Schwarzenegger was doing this purely for publicity or something. But the notion of his campaign not being serious led to a huge problem because Arnold Schwarzenegger quickly became the frontrunner for the race. The only one who was able to bring a sufficient challenge was Bustamante, who would sometimes tie with Schwarzenegger in polls. As such, the candidates started attacking Schwarzenegger hard, most prominently Ariana Huffington describing her and Schwarzenegger's candidacies as the hybrid versus the Hummer. On September 3rd, the first debate of the cycle happened with one interesting thing, Schwarzenegger was not in the debate, and instead, there was a minor candidate named Peter Erboff, who was considered the sixth highest polling in the race. The reason being, Schwarzenegger stated that he would not participate in debates early in the cycle and would only participate in the last debate in the cycle. The other candidate simply said it was because Arnold was ill-prepared for the campaign and was hiding from his opponents, and kind of was like, I mean, maybe this is just a big publicity stunt. The month had shown the race was pretty much these five, so smaller candidates started dropping out of the race, including Urboff. Though it wasn't until September 24th where things shifted again, as the five frontrunners held a debate at California State University, the most notable exchanges of the debate being the ones between Arnold and Ariana. Though the debate had actually led to the field narrowing even more so, as Ariana Huffington had decided to drop out of the race and endorsed Davis's call to stop the recall, though she would still end up being on the ballot due to the fact that it was a late exit. Immediately after she dropped out, 
Bustamante endorsed her plan for public financing of elections as a way to siphon off her support. Eventually, election day approached and the results ended up showing Davis was recalled with 54.4% of voters saying get rid of him and 446 saying keep him around. Now who would end up replacing him? This is a big shock that I'm pretty sure nobody has ever heard of before. Though if you actually don't know this, Arnold Schwarzenegger won with 48.6% of the vote, Bustamante getting a close second with 31.5% of the vote, McClintock getting 13.4% of the vote, and Kameho getting 2.8% of the vote. And Schwarzenegger would end up winning a second term as governor of California. So yes, Schwarzenegger actually shares the same honor as Earl Warren, Supreme Court Justice, and Hiram Johnson. It's a very interesting world we live in. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click that bell to be notified when a future video mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, join my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. Yeah, I know I made a video saying that I probably wouldn't do this, but I gave a caveat and the caveat has been reached and I'm not making a video on this topic. You may have a couple of questions about this. For starters, you may be wondering, why 60? Well, very simple. I originally wanted to do my top 435, but then I realized, mm, nah, that's, that's a bit too much. Especially considering with senators, you have like a huge biography you can look into. Whereas for the House of Representatives, a lot of House members, their biography is literally X name. They served in Congress from X year to X year. The end. There are some websites where I could look into their platforms and such, but that again, way too many House members to do that for. So I decided let's just make it an even 60 and be done with it. Alright, now here's some ground rules for the list. One, I want to keep this briefer than the Senate video or the or potential gubernatorial video or like other like top 10 lists. So the descriptions for these guys are going to be a bit more briefer, but you know, it'll just give you a better chance to look into that. And due to this, they'll be a bit more broad in positioning. Like logistically, if you switch two and three, there really isn't going to be much difference. Same with like... 59 and 58 you can switch them and it doesn't really matter these are just 60 representatives that i find pretty cool and you should probably look into them if you're into this kind of stuff or not another thing anybody who has made it onto my previous senators list or president's rankings will not be allowed to be in this list but they can 100 percent make it into future senate lists that i might do Wink, wink. Next, I, is I will try to keep current House members to a minimum. Only picking the best of the best of the current representatives. Even though they logistically could have made good filler choices to make the list longer. But I just wanted to give you more historical figures, you know. To make this one more objective and cool and historical sounding. Alright, now with that out of the way, here are my top 60 House Representatives in U.S. History. Number 60, Walter B. Jones. Walter Jones is the furthest in regards to my views on a lot of things. Pretty much all of his like social issues and a lot of his economic issues. But I do really like the story of how he became a fervent non-interventionist due to the Iraq war and I logistically think eh, that's pretty good I can commend him for that number 59 Thaddeus Stevens while Thaddeus Stevens started his career as a terrible know-nothing he became a radical abolitionist Republican and that's pretty good in his time period being a radical Republican was pretty lit back then number 58 Thomas E Watson he was a great leader of the People's Party in the House, passing certain bills like the Rural Free Delivery Service, even when he had only eight members of his party in Congress. However, his short House tenures kinda when his good qualities kinda went As 
He's not going to be making it on my set list anytime soon. <laughs> Number 57, Daniel Lindsay Russell. He was pretty much the Marion Butler of the House of Representatives, teaming up the Republican Party with the Greenbacks to pass some good legislation, though he didn't serve too long in the House to have a big impact. Number 56, Garrett Smith. He was a very popular abolitionist at the time period, but like the last one, his tenure was way too small to make a big impact. Number 55, John Paul Quayle. He was the longest representative of the former Labor Party in the House of Representatives. Number 54, George Schneider. He was the leading progressive in the House after he left the Republican Party. Number 53, William Fitz Ryan. He was the first representative to critique the Vietnam War, but I'll be honest, the person who would end up replacing him would be way better. Number 52, Roy William Weir. He was a pretty far to the left congressman, but there's really nothing too notable about him. Number 51, Claude Kitchen. He was an opponent to World War I and frequently clashed with Woodrow Wilson. Despite this, he got to be in top House of Representatives positions representing the Democrats. Number 50, Adam Clayton Powell, a very progressive Democrat standing up for black rights, but had some money controversy that puts him down a peg. But hey, at least it's not like anti-Semitism or becoming an extremely far-right Republican further down the line. Number 49, Craig Washington. He was a very left member of the House from Texas and one of the furthest left the House has ever had. Number 48, John Lewis. Me and John, we've had our differences. If you listen to my podcast, you know where we clash. But he has a good record and it should be commended for what it was. Number 47, Franklin D. Roosevelt Jr. was very interesting as he was the literal son of FDR, who pretty much tried to model himself in his father's image, but even though he had a huge amount of influence, and the fact that he was able to win with a third party banner, he did not use any of that to his advantage. Number 46, Joseph Rainey. He was the first African American elected to the House of Representatives. He did a good job fighting for African American rights and such. Number 45, Davy Crockett adamantly opposed Jackson, especially the Indian removal, and also gave his own party some of its fair critiques. Number 44, Morris Hinchy. He was one of the earliest voices in the House of Representatives to oppose fracking. Being one of the forefront persons on an issue is a pretty good thing. Number 43, Lynn Woolsey. She was a leading congressional progressive during her time period, Though, probably not as much as we would say a progressive is today. Number 42, John Olver, another very similar, decently leftist congressman, who probably should have stayed around given how the Democrats are going now. Number 41, George Miller, he was one of the leading progressive Watergate babies in the House of Representatives. His successor's alright, but I mean, if he was still around, Nobody would be bothered that much. Number 40, Helen Goghan Douglas. She was a New Deal liberal that was smeared by Nixon in the Senate run as the Pink Lady. Definitely worth supporting. Number 39, Benjamin Franklin Butler. He was a radical Republican in the time period where that was lit. Trying to smash the KKK before they were born and fighting for the rights of former slaves definitely makes up for his looks. Number 38, Brad Miller. He was a leading voice in the House of Representatives for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and probably one of the best representatives North Carolina elected. Number 37, Lane Evans. He was one of the founding members of the Progressive Caucus back in the time when the Progressive Caucus was decently to the left. Before like half of their members left and then the other half kind of went watering down on their message. Number 36, Allard K. Lowenstein, a very progressive anti-war Democrat, but tenure was one term, so can't really make a big record on that. Number 35, Mo Udall. I wasn't sure about him at first, you know, too mainstream for my taste, 
but looking at his record, he he's fine and definitely deserves at least some of the praise he was given. Number 34, Patsy Mink. She was a very prominent progressive congresswoman, also the first Asian woman of color elected to Congress. Number 33, James Roosevelt. The more effective of the Roosevelt kids, also known for being one of the earliest anti-McCarthy congressmen. Number 32, Daniel Webster, a very prominent historical congressman who was able to make the Federalists look good for a brief period of time. Number 31, Henry Clay. This was one of the few times that Clay was actually successful, and for the time period, he was fine. Number 30, Mike Campuano. He was just an overall leftist like the typical Massachusetts liberal type. Even the person who would end up primarying him agreed, eh, he's fine. Number 29, Claude Pepper, a very progressive congressman from Florida who we'll probably be knowing more about in the future. Number 28, Jeanette Rankin. She was the first woman elected to the House of Representatives who was a well-known pacifist and a suffragette. Number 27, Leo Isaacson, prominent leftist congressman that was helpful to Henry Wallace's presidential campaign, even kind of serving as a proxy between him and Truman, but he was just a one-termer, so his coolness doesn't get too far. Number 26, William H. Mayer, another prominent leftist congressman who, after his one term, kick-started another person's political career, but even though he was the furthest left congressman, it's still just one term. Number 25, Harold Washington, a Chicago progressive who rallied against the establishment in favor of minorities. Number 24, Emmanuel Seller, leading voice for Civil Rights Act and was kind of the Estes Keeve offer of the house. Number 23, George Brown Jr., a fierce opponent of the Vietnam War and a fierce advocate for the Civil Rights Act. Number 22, Philip Burton, was a very progressive congressman breaking with tradition, also known for being the first to push for AIDS legislation. Number 21, Tip O'Neill, House Speaker who was actually really progressive on a lot of issues, such as universal health care and even a federal jobs guarantee. Number 20, Major Owens, the DSA-affiliated librarian congressman who is way on the level of his predecessor. Number 19, David Bonier, the leading congressional voice against NAFTA and apparent longtime DSA member. Number 18, Pete Stark, a very progressive congressman during his 40-year tenure, plus the first openly atheist congressman. Number 17, Alan Grayson, an aggressive progressive who had a pretty good tenure, all things considered. Number 16, John Conyers, a very progressive congressman who set the stage for a political issue that is now at the forefront of our discourse. But allegations that led to him resigning were pretty bad that kind of knocked him down from being any higher. Number 15, Ron Dellums, a very known open democratic socialist congressman who was very notable for the time. Number 14, Fiorello LaGuardia, a fierce pro-labor New York socialist, kind of like a certain newer person we may have been hearing about. Number 13, William Lemke, a progressive populist who worked across many party lines to get things done. Number 12, James B. Weaver, a very good leftist congressman who butted heads with the political establishment of both political parties. Number 11, William Jennings Bryan, very similar to Weaver, but maybe you could argue he was more successful in the long run. Number 10, Victor L. Berger, the first Socialist Party member to be elected to Congress and even had many bold ideas, even compared to now. Number 9, Keith Ellison, he walked so that someone else could run. Number 8, Bella Abzug. Battling Bella was AOC long before AOC was born. Speaking of which, number 7, AOC. Now I know she's pretty new, but I mean, she has been notable for all things considered. She has a long career ahead of her, so we'll see if she stays here or if she goes down or up. Number 6, Barbara Lee, 
the lone vote against the authorization of military force for Iraq. That will forever cement her in the progressive movement, even if she makes a hiccup here and there. Number 5, Ro Khanna, the leading modern progressive in the house, definitely worth your support. Number 4, Vito Marcantonio, another socialist Italian, but was the glue that pretty much held his entire party together. Number 3, Mayor London, definitely the better of the two socialist party congressmen, most notable for being the lone voice against the Sedition Act. Number 2, Shirley Chisholm. She was elected unbought and unbossed, and definitely retired that way. And number 1, we have Dennis Kucinich. Kucinich has a very interesting political career, who might get a video on his own, all things considered. But all you need to know is, for his record, He's been a very long-standing progressive who was at the forefront of plenty of issues in our political discourse. So yeah, those are 60 representatives that I think are pretty neat. And I don't think I'll be making a part 2 or part 3, so just stick with these guys and you'll be good. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when the future video mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Facebook or Twitter, join my Discord, or check out my articles on the Independent Political Report. Welcome to Politics in Media, a new series where I will analyze political themes in the media. You know, movies, TV shows, video games, etc, etc. And how do I kickstart this brilliant new series that combines two of my interests? by talking absolutely nothing about politics. Yeah, for some reason, I thought this would be an interesting video topic idea, and even though it really isn't that political oriented, I was like, hey, do you guys want me to cover it? And you said, yeah, sure, why not? So it's all your fault that this video exists. Whoops. We all know about film ratings, right? You know, G and R are considered the polar opposites in the rating system. Well, originally, there were two other ratings that were almost completely unrecognizable today. M for Mature, which quickly became PG, and X. X was the black sheep of the ratings board, while well, all the other ratings were aimed at more mature audiences, added the caveat that adult supervision was good enough to have a child enter the theater. X was pretty clear in stating no child may enter the film, period. The themes that are in this film are just too taboo for them to see. I mean, the X rating wasn't even trademarked by the MPA so that they wouldn't be associated with any of the subjects tackled in the film, and directors could just add it to their own movies whenever they felt like it. And while it was still accepted that X rated films could be viewed by mainstream movie going audiences 17 and up, X rated films. They weren't really advertised or booked as much in theaters and couldn't make as much money as they could with, say, a Star Wars or an Indiana Jones type. No X-rated film was a particular blockbuster, in a sense. However, this isolation from the rest of the movie going public was, in a sense, a good thing. You see, since they didn't have to focus on if the film would be a smash hit to make millions of dollars, the filmmakers mostly focused on the quality, and as such, many X-rated films were very highly rated, even to this day. Though that could also be due to the fact that since a good chunk of the moviegoers were not going to be able to make it to the theater to see these movies, the audience was mostly packed with film critics, the snobs who read the reviews in papers, and people who just generally heard of the film via word of mouth, making X-rated films mostly cult classics in a sense. And again, since they didn't have to focus on the general movie going public, they didn't really have to focus on dumbing down the movies and just making it like a action whatever fest. They could tackle very deep subjects that most of the mainstream movies would never even touch. Like, I mean, come on. Would Star Wars have had a gay romance? No. No, it wouldn't have. And well, yes, you did still have the people who were just doing it for, like, you know, the sex and violence, but that was also beneficial because they were also helping kickstart genres, like the black exploitation genre and the adult animation genre. 
and the X-rated film craze even coincided with the home video phase, so they could still sort of keep their cult classic status, while also being able to actually start making a big profit of their films. Now you might say, wait, if the X rating did a lot of these things for like film and stuff, why did the X rating die? Four letters. P-O-R-N. Yeah, the rise in the home media market was also the rise of the home porn market. Coincidentally, anime also rose during these time periods. Isn't that a little weird? And you see, since the X rating could be added to the films by the filmmakers themselves without the association of the MPAA, pornographic directors would simply just slap the X rating onto their films. Now all of a sudden, Backdoor MILFs 12 has the same rating as Midnight Cowboy. Though to be fair, some of these filmmakers had an interesting idea of adding multiple X's to show that it was raunchier than your average X-rated film, which is where we got the association of triple X being pornography. This hijacking of the X rating made people no longer associate the X rating with just, oh, this film's just a bit more raunchier than, say, an R-rated movie, but instead now being associated with literal smut which, in turn, led to more ostracization of X-rated films, both metaphorically and physically by putting them in the back of the video store. So now, all films that were rated X were pretty much put in the porn room. And it was just common knowledge back then that if you went to the back of the video store, you were renting something naughty. You could tell your friends all day long, no, 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 I was just renting a Clockwork Orange. But they just look at you and be like, Come on bro, we know you were looking for super horny over others. This in turn led to big name companies realizing, hmm, the X rating has suddenly become a lot less profitable than we originally thought. Maybe we should finally pull the plug on all of our X rated films, and would now do everything in their power to make sure that R became the new X. Starting by editing their currently existing X rated films, like A Clockwork Orange, Evil Dead, and Midnight Cowboy, to have R-rated versions of them, and then films that were currently in production would now be lowered from an X rating to an R rating, such as Robocop, which led to the R rating becoming more mainstream, thus leading to more film companies to follow suit, effectively leaving the X rating to the porn industry. The X rating was so dead, it was a whole lot more easier for them to make the film unrated which led to a new craze of the unrated cut, which continued even up to the 2000s. Though, soon after the X rating had officially been left, they decided to create a new rating called NC-17, which would effectively be the new X rating. And to make sure that there wasn't a repeat of the X rating, they would officially trademark it and put it on some movies. Emphasis on some, because as I said, the R rating became a whole lot more mainstream. So anything above that is literally just, why bother? So yeah, that's where the X rating went my friends. Tune in next year when this series will become a whole lot more political. <laughs> Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Twitter, join my Discord, or check out my articles in the Independent Political Report. 2020 is coming to a close. Now, as you've probably figured out by this point, I, myself, am the most brilliant, smartest, handsomest, um, coolest, um, 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 uh, um charismatic, um, let's just cut to the chase. I'm pretty much the most perfect YouTuber on the entire planet. However, even perfection doesn't lead to perfection, if you know what I mean. You see, even someone as brilliant and amazing as me has been prone to make teeny, teeny, wincy, tiny bit mistakes. But I mean, come on, it's only enough to fill two, that'd be three, more likely going to be a whole lot more videos. So I guess I should go over some of the biggest ones I made this year so you can point at me and laugh at me like they did in high school. Just as a heads up, a majority of them are going to revolve around my Mexican presidential election series, which 
technically closed its doors this year. Now to those who felt that that wasn't necessarily the best send off to the series. One, technically it isn't a send off because, you know, the elections still happen and they're going to be more down the road unless Mexico literally becomes a literal fascist dictatorship. And B, I'm going to give it a more dignified send off at the beginning of next year, I guess you could say. Even then, I don't know if it's going to be the best bet send off. You'll, you'll see what I mean in the video. But with all that out of the way... Here are the next 10 e Plebisodium screw-ups of 2020. Quick reiteration of the seizure warning. Skip to this time code if you do not want to die. Wallace and Thomas did not run against Ike and Adley. This can easily be explained, but pretty much just because I was stupid and didn't really think clearly. In my Socialist Party of America video, I was discussing the Henry Wallace Communist Party fiasco and how Norman Thomas jumped into the fray to run against Wallace. Then I made the claim that Thomas and Wallace ran alongside Adley Stevenson and Ike Eisenhower, but it doesn't matter because neither of them became president anyways, despite the fact that these two did not run against Adley Stevenson and Dwight Eisenhower, they ran against Thomas Dewey and Harry Truman. I, for some reason, just combined two elections into one. And then just for some reason, it didn't click into my head that I did so. Like, there's literally no other explanation or anything like that. I just made an error. Move on. Some of your favorite senators don't quite add up. Well, first of all, you don't really know me. You don't know if I like these senators just a little bit more than the rest. It's my opinion. These are my opinion videos. But I guess I will address some of the criticisms that were made in my top 11 best senators list. I added some folks that weren't apparently as keno as other folks. The two ones that were brought to my attention were Elizabeth Warren being in honor of the honorable mentions and Hiram Johnson being number 10. Though I guess you could also argue some other folks like Thomas Gore might not be too keno as others or even to a degree Bobby Kennedy. Now with Liz, I will 100% agree on two merits. One, and two, the idea of honorable mentions is just stupid, especially considering I literally changed my mind. I thought this was going to be the one and done, but then I decided, nah, let's keep going. I have scripts for the second one fully written and will come out next year. Then I have a third one that is still being written and I have a fourth one that I'm just drafting right now. I think at this point, I'm going to be making 10 videos to make a full senate of people I like. Now to address the Hiram Johnson criticisms, well yes I will agree that his Chinese exclusion wasn't necessarily the best part of his career. He has a whole lot of other progressive reforms that I would argue basically were way better and just, I got, like I said, way better. Hiram's got a whole video to himself to talk about all those. Though I would say, maybe if I had known about certain senators prior, maybe Hiram would have been booted to this list, or like I said, maybe even Bobby or even Thomas Gore might have been booted off the list, or even or even just Robert LaFollette Jr., because to be honest, that is kind of a cheap shot, just like, oh, Robert LaFollette and the other Robert LaFollette. So yeah, you just heard a ton of videos that will be coming out soon, so be on the lookout for those. <laughs> Lacey Clay's speech came before Tom Tecrendo's. No one brought this up, but I felt that it was probably decent enough to be mentioned at one point. During my video about the Congressional Black Caucus, I included a bit about some controversy surrounding the caucus between Representative Steve Cohen, former Representative Tom Tecrendo, and FORMER 
Representative Lacey Clay. And I included some speeches that they made, either saying that the caucus shouldn't exist, or how they feel that caucus is very important and shouldn't be tainted. The problem is, I technically kind of swapped the speeches. You see, Tecrendo's speech was in response to Lacey, who was responding to Steve. But the way I formatted the video, it made it seem like Lacey was responding to Tom. I guess my reasoning was that it was more thematic to end the video on the Black Concus on a speech made by a member of the Concus and, you know, giving it like a good dignified ending explaining like what the Concus stands for and such and why it needs to exist rather than ending it with a speech about a guy who literally wants to abolish the Concus. I mean, the video was made for Black History Month, not anti-Black History Month. So yeah. That's pretty much all I gotta say about this little fake controversy. Move on to the next bit. Was mentioning X candidate really necessary? This was honestly probably one of the bigger issues that I had in my Mexican presidential election series. You see, it was a bit difficult to really see which candidate was truly worth mentioning. You see, as my channel is all about mentioning the little guy, it's a little hard for me to find out exactly where the little guy should stop being mentioned. Like, I mean, I made a video about Jack Feller who got like 10 votes in his entire lifetime, so I'm definitely not too keen on saying maybe we shouldn't mention a person in a video. Let me give an example. The video about the 1934 presidential election, Cardenas and Villarreal were not the only two candidates running for the presidency. There were in fact two more presidential candidates, Adelberto Olivares and Hernán Laborde. Laborde was actually running with the Mexican Communist Party, who as we know would play a sort of role in the broader left in Mexico. Yet I didn't mention them because Laborde got 539 votes and Adelberto got 0.7%. So, not exactly that much of a game changer in a sense. Like, these guys weren't exactly the Teddy Roosevelt of the race, but these two were prominent individuals. So, I guess just establish a 1% rule? You know, I guess that's fair, right? Well, okay. Then how about Enrique E. Calderon? He's a literal nobody. His party was relatively nothing. So what the heck do I do? Well, I already established the 1% rule, so he gets to be included. Eventually, I had to kind of set like the weird rule of like, they had to play a factor in the race. Like, I mean, you know, again, the percentage, but you also got to play some major role in the race. Like, for example, I stretched the rule again to include Rosario Ibarra in the videos, because Rosario Ibarra was also a prominent member of the Mexican left, and she played viable roles in both presidential elections she participated in. It's weird, but I guess technically since the series is over, there's not much I can do about it now. The Cubby Chronicles was not just new grounds. This is another mistake that is just simply a brain fart. In my top 10 presidential elections video, I was talking about how the 2008 election was the real beginning of candidates using the internet for campaigning. One of the examples that I used was a libertarian candidate by the name of Steve Cubby having a flash movie on Newgrounds talking about his presidential campaign as a sort of promotion thing. However, one quick YouTube search would have shown... Yes, I literally screen recorded it on the Newgrounds player for nothing. I guess it was my ill-fabled attempt to keep Newgrounds relevant, especially considering Flash is literally stated to go down. But hey, at least we have the Newgrounds player so that we can still play Flash movies, and um, they allow other formats so people can post not Flash on there. Also, a side note, e you play on Newgrounds? Let me know your thoughts. 
the Thomas Long debate was not held on radio. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna have to kiss one aspect of this lost debate goodbye. You see, in my video about presidential debates, I briefly mentioned a radio debate between Huey Long and Norman Thomas being a sort of precursor to the official radio presidential debates, much in the same way that the Lincoln-Douglas debates were held as a sort of precursor to presidential debates. As the, you know, thing I just said said, it was not held on radio at all. <laughs> it was a public debate that people went to see live, which means we are more than likely not going to be hearing the audio of the two people debating each other. However, don't be completely disheartened yet. There are other aspects that we could potentially try and find, but we're gonna have to save that for next year. Your skipping of the Mexican Revolution and the events immediately preceding it led to some huge info gaps. Okay, so first I guess I'm gonna have to explain again why I skipped to where I did. 1917 was the first election in Mexican history where universal male suffrage was a thing and post-revolutionary Mexico is sort of what is seen as modern day Mexico. You see, with America, when it was founded, that was the same country as it is today. It just got bigger. You see, the Mexico of the independence is not the same as the Mexico of the revolution. And even the events immediately preceding it weren't exactly the same thing. And even if I did go in-depth into the revolution, there are huge issues. You see, there are many kinds of like conflicts, like... People consistently switch sides. It was eventually just way too complicated for a channel that is mostly focused on the political aspects. I did cover the sort of last legs of the revolution as it kind of coincides with the first couple of Mexican presidential elections. However, again, since I skipped the majority of the revolution, I led to it led to huge amounts of information gaps. Most prominently, I don't get it, but I somehow managed to leave out Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa, the two most prominent revolutionaries in Mexican history, just not mentioned <laughs> at all. Despite the fact that like, you could even say like, well, okay, maybe we might give you a little bit of leniency because you didn't exactly, like, they, they were kind of gone by that point. No, they were still around when Carranza became president. In fact, they were his earliest critics, and they sort of played a role in a lot of the early administrations. What I mean that? Carranza and Garza ordered Zapata killed. Okay, he's dead now. His army doesn't know what to do. They don't have a leader, they're kind of lost. Okay, Obregon shows up and says, hey, you know, I'm having some troubles with Karanz of my own. And it turns out, yeah, he was the one who killed Zapata. So, why don't you work with me? It makes me president. And then, you know, I can give you what you want. Okay, and that's what happened. So, right off the bat, I already screwed up because the forces that Obregon used to get Karanz out were the Zapatistas. The OG ones, not these ones. They formed the Laborist Party's base alongside the labor unions, who were also angry about the treatment that they received during the Diaz administration. Okay, they solidify a base, they pretty much get to remain in power. That is, until 1924, when there's talks of former revolutionary Pancho Villa throwing his hat into the ring for the presidential election. Caius was like, mm -mm, I got some plans for the presidency, so bye-bye. As you can see, they still have a role to play in Mexican politics. And I mean, a lot of the stuff that came really came from pre-revolutionary politics, which, again, I didn't really cover because on one hand, it was just the Senate electing the president, and then they slowly but steadily added just rigged election after rigged election after rigged election. But I guess since technically the PRI rigged a bunch of elections, maybe I could just go back and do the remaining Mexican presidential elections in the past. But even then, I don't count on it. Why did you not eventually add the Senate and the governor's races 
You see, that was actually a bit of the controversy in my head for a bit. You see, the only reason I started talking about the chamber and not talking about the senate or the governorships was that there was actually a change. You see, before 1940, it was just the precursor of the PRM and PNR galore, but 1940 gave them one seat in the lower chamber. And even not that long afterwards, it went back to full PNR, so I didn't even talk about that one. But slowly but steadily, the lower chamber started getting a bit more diverse, but the Senate still remained mostly just PRI. That was until the major electoral reforms of proportional representation literally made it so that the minor parties were pretty much forced to have someone represent them. Now you'd think that's when I would talk about the Senate races, and even to a degree the gubernatorial races, because the gubernatorial races also do have some prominence in how popular a party is. You know, if a party gets wiped out in the governor's races, you know, it's a good indicator that the party's not doing so hard. But, nah, it just didn't, for some reason. I really don't know why. So yeah, that's all I gotta say about that one. It's too late to fix that now, so let's move on. That's not how the Fox meeting went down. Yeah, apparently I played a hand in the hyping up of Fox's campaign 20 years after it actually happened. Remember that famous oi 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 confrontation? Well, apparently it wasn't as hectic as I was led to believe. No fist slamming, no yelling, and interestingly enough, no oi oi oi. You see, the way it was spun in the Mexican media was that Fox was screaming and he was like saying, No, oi, oi, oi. But the actual confrontation that him, Cardenas, and La Bastida had was a whole lot more dignified. You see, the oi's were just separate from each other. They weren't simultaneously said. And they weren't screamed. There was no fist slamming. Fox said it more snidely. He was being snarky to one of the other candidates. Like, like something, like the conversation would go along the lines of, what if we had the debate in a, you know, format that was more formatted to the more popular channels? Today. The, the full conversation will be linked in the description, but it's, it's, that's pretty much how it went down. But of course, with Pre having control of the media, they were pretty much able to spin it however they wanted to. However, I guess that is more of a good advantage to Fox, because Fox was able to still turn that into an electoral win. So who's laughing now? Like, I mean, is Enrique Peña Nieto Gary Johnson's favorite president? I didn't think so. It's Chamber of Deputies, you idiot. Okay, this is a simple thing to see. As you can see from this picture, it says that the name of Mexico's lower legislative chamber is the Chamber of Deputies. It is a common name for legislative chambers around the world. Due to the fact that my series was very prominent and I had to go through multiple articles, especially this one multiple times, you would think that I would have grasped that it was called the Chamber of Deputies. However, if your seats in the Chamber of Duties, in the Chamber of Duties, Chamber of Duties, and of the Chamber of Duties, and of the Chamber of Duties, and of the Chamber of Duties, he made it so the Chamber of Duties, the seats in the Chamber of Duties, Chamber of Duties, and of the Chamber of Duties, it's in the Chamber of Duties, Chamber of Duties, and the Chamber of Duties, the Chamber of Duties, Chamber of Duties, Chamber of Duties, and the Chamber of Duties, and the Chamber of Duties. Okay, 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 I get it. I get it. I've been to both the English and Spanish Wikipedia pages multiple times throughout like a year or two years even. I should have known what the thing was called. I should have known. But I just, I didn't. It just made sense to me. They were a chamber that performed duties. Simple. And how come I didn't notice when they were all called federal deputies? I, I don't know. It was it was the name. That was just what they were called. Like literally the second that I found this out, I knew it had to be number one. So yeah, 2020 has come to a close, and those are my screws for the year. It wasn't the best year. It was probably good for my channel, but it probably wasn't the best in every other aspect. 
Now, I think you all might agree that it's finally time that I stop talking about Mexican politics. After January, where I will be ranking all of the Mexican presidents post-revolution. Now, since I want 2021 to be, you know, better than 2020... Let's start off with the bad foot first so that we can only go up from there and rank the worst Mexican presidents first. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when a future video comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Twitter, join my Discord, or check out my articles in the Independent Political Report.